Good evening, everyone, and welcome to ANC 2C's community meeting uh, for July 13th, 2021. Um, it is 6.02, the calendar just, I mean, the clock just went to 6.02, um, and I like to call this meeting uh, to order. Uh, we have three of three commissioners present at our meeting this evening. Um, and just an introduction of commissioners. Why don't I just, um, my name is uh, Commissioner Michael Schenkel and I am the chair of ANC2C and Ellie. Hmm. I'm Ellie Miskey and I am the commissioner for 2CO2. Hi, Gigi Nelson, commissioner for 2CO3. Terrific. Thanks uh, for all the commissioners being here this evening. Um, we have um, uh, we have the agenda um, available uh, for folks. I do want to um, have commissioners. Have you had an opportunity to review the agenda? Yes. Yes. Great. There are are there any um, updates or adjustments that you have? No. Awesome. You do we want to um, take off the capital grid project since that's not going to be discussed? Well, I, I, want, I want to ask uh, Linda Greenin, um, who is active there, um, if she wants to make an announcement about it or okay. would you like us to uh, just issue the after hours permit or uh, approval of the after hours? We'll come back to Linda. Are you, are you asking me? I'm, I am asking you. Okay, Hi, how are you? Oh, okay, well, let me join. Let me, and sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, you know, it's 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 up to uh, you. It's up to the commissioner Nelson if it's her SMD. I will say there's just one slight change, and that is I thought we were going to start the work next Monday. It's now not going to start until the 26th. Um, and we, you know, we just want to make sure that the that the community, the ANC, is clear that this work, when it starts, uh, there will be a portion of it that will go literally twenty four seven, because the uh, and this is all in the architect of the capital area. It's not there's there aren't any real there aren't any real I didn't mean, there aren't any residents there. So. Um, but um, the architect of the Capitol is anxious for us to get to get the work done and get out of there. So yeah. anyway, I just wanted to make sure that folks know about it. And um, yes, we would appreciate your support for the after hours permit and um, any questions. So. Um, and this and GT, um, I know you have that email. Do you want Linda to stay on and just talk about it a little bit or do you feel comfortable? Just issuing the after hours. I'm comfortable like, issuing it. I'll awesome. give the information. Thanks so much. Really awesome. no problem. Thank sorry, you. sorry, Linda. <laughs> We've got you on, and um, oh no, 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 no. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and you know, really, I was here just in case there were any questions. So that was great. So thank you. Awesome. You're um, very welcome. If we can get that um, as soon as possible, that would be helpful because the application is pending and it's yeah. pending um, ANC um, consideration. So, okay. and great. if you need my help commissioner in terms of who to send it to, uh, just let me know. All right, thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks, Linda. So is that it? I'm done. Is You're done. <laughs> You're out. Awesome. You. And now, Michael, I know how to get you. I've been stalking you. I've been, but but I've been using the wrong email address. So, um, uh -oh. so I have to know your Gmail. Um, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. That's not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> oh, that either. Oh my gosh. No. All right. Well, thank you all. All thank right. You thank you very much. Nice. Um, there are uh, two. Um, corrections to the agenda this evening. Um, one is related to um, the 2021 uh, Downtown DC on Wheels uh, presentation. Mike Berman, president of Diverse Markets Management is gonna be presenting uh, that on behalf of the uh, bid. And um, secondly, um, related um, to the Ninth Street Protected Bike Lane, uh, George uh, Brannion, um, Active Transportation Branch Manager, uh, Planning and Sustainability Division for DDOT, 
is uh, going to be presenting um, that. And I uh, did make an error um, that Mike Goodnow is uh, not the bike program intern. He is the uh, bicycle program specialist with DDOT. Um, those are my um, corrections to the uh, agenda this evening. Uh, with that, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a, uh, a motion and a second. And all in favor? Okay, three of three commissioners uh, voting Michael, in favor. Sorry, did, could you repeat, did you say the downtown DC on wheels is going to be uh, at a different meeting or someone else is presenting? Mm -hmm. Someone else is presenting. Okay, I'll, I'll just look, I'll keep it up. I wasn't sure. Yes, showing. someone Thank else you. is presenting. Got it. Terrific. Um, commissioners, have you had the opportunity to review the June 2021 minutes? Yes. yes. With You just filled in those couple parts in the beginning, right? Yes, I did. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did that right after our last meeting as I delayed and I was like, oh crap, how did I do that? So let me go back and fill that in quickly. No problem. Um, so um, are there any corrections or additions to the meeting minutes? No. No. I would like to move that we approve the June 2021 minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Three of three commissioners voting in favor of the approval of the minutes. Um, Commissioner Nelson, the treasurer's report. Okay, so the opening balance for June was $56,403.34. There was one disbursement in the amount of $175, and the closing balance is $56,228.34. Terrific. Awesome. Any questions for Commissioner Nelson? Awesome. Um, we'd like to uh, move on for our uh, community announcements this evening, and I'd like to invite uh, Ward 2 Mayor's Liaison, Joe um, Florio. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to start in right away a couple of general announcements. Um, Mayor Bowser released the Homeward DC 2.0 plan. This is the district's updated plan for making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. Um, this plan increases increased uh, prevention and diversion resources. There's new permanent supportive housing vouchers and $102 million in renovations of the district's permanent and temporary supportive housing shelter services. I am dropping that plan in the chat right now. It's a little long, but that's that's the plan there. Um, the DMV Services Center and Adjudication Services will return to walk-in services beginning the week of July 19th. Um, the DMV will honor all appointments made through uh, Saturday, July 17th, but none will be available after that date. I believe I was assisting Commissioner Schenkel on a, on a resident's uh, concern about the uh, appointments and we're going back to normal. So showing up to the DMV and hopefully there's no lines. Uh, so that's, that's gonna be moving forward starting July 19th. Uh, there's a couple, uh, uh, more uh, ANC 2C focused issues. Um, I'm communicating with DDOT about a request to repave the alleyway between 5th and 6th, just north of uh, H Street. I know this is the same alleyway we've been talking about for a while now. Um, I've communicated with residents of the 6th Street Flats about any outstanding 311 requests. I submitted my own 311 request for that alleyway, but I'm collecting older service request numbers to provide to DDOT um, and then kind of showing building a case that this alleyway has been requested for a while. Um, if any person, uh, individual on the call tonight, um, you know, has any old service request numbers regarding this alleyway, please feel free to send those to me. I will drop my email address in the chat if no one has it or if those individuals don't have it, but I will, prov I will keep providing those numbers to DDOT. Um, as I get them. Uh, same alleyway. Um, I, I don't remember if I have given this update since the last me uh, meeting, the June meeting, 
Uh, I, I've uh, worked with the downtown bid uh, to pay special attention to this alleyway. I've kind of given them a high level of some of the issues that have been going on and they have gone back in that alleyway, taking care of trash, bulk trash, uh, power washed. You know, I know that there was a certain case where there were needles. They went and picked up some needles that were um, in the area and their work is greatly appreciated. You know, I just kind of alerted them and they just went out and did it. So kudos to them uh, in doing a great job. And I've encouraged them to keep uh, up that work. The same thing I'm doing with DPW. I've let them know that their services are still required and attention is still made in this alleyway. Um, so I'm still getting uh, continual updates and then I'm also reporting what I hear from the community. Um, and then I'm working on separately uh, on a meeting to discuss the nuances of enforcing grease trap violations. Uh, and this is going to be with DPW, DC Water, DOE to see if we can somehow like break through on this because I know it's difficult. Uh, I don't know why it's difficult, but it is a little difficult to um, enforce these uh, types of violations. So I will stop there. I will put my um, email in the chat so that way people can get in touch with me, but I'll turn it back over to the chair. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joe. Um, and I do appreciate your, um, your help, definitely. You and Genevieve for help uh, with uh, keeping on the the alleyway um, direction there and, and helping to improve that, that environment. Um, one of the um, challenges that um, individuals were um, um, concerned about regarded, uh, was it regarding the encampments that were happening around, um, around uh, the, the city actually, across the city um, and um, uh, recently, in fact, uh, last Friday, um, Joe so kindly pointed out that uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton office uh, distributed um, an email um, indicating that the National Park Service has been engaged in conversations about encampments in the national parks in DC, the city and community partners. Uh, but there is no imminent plans to remove um, existing encampments at this time. Um, we are, uh, as an ANC, uh, we are going to be holding um, a special meeting that we can start talking about some of these issues more broadly and how we can address them um, as, um, as a commission and as a community as well. Um, this is a very uh, challenging issue. It's not just re um, related to 2C, but it is a city issue um, and a, a human rights issue that we have to really kind of figure out the best approach uh, for everyone um, involved um, in this situation. Uh, so we will be making an announcement shortly. We've been coordinating with DHS. Um, we're gonna be reaching out to the, the Park Service and, and um, Eleanor Harms Norton's office um, to coordinate this meeting and uh, to have a discussion um, about that shortly. Um, are there any uh, questions uh, for Joe? Right. Terrific. Um, and I'd like to uh, move uh, forward uh, to uh, the Ward 2 Council Member Printo's update and Genevieve Hudlick. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, I have a number of updates, but probably the one that will be most interesting for you is that just a f hour ago, the council passed legislation to allow ANCs to meet virtually um, through the end of January and into February of 2022. So wanted to share that um, news with you all. <laughs> That's actually uh, great news. I actually, we were actually very concerned about how we were returning to our um, our meeting locations uh, since they were not open. So thank you for that update. That's terrific. Yeah, I know um, some other ANCs have been talking about how they can do hybrid. And so um, it might be worthwhile to connect mm -hmm. with your neighboring um, ANCs. I know ANC2F was gonna yeah. try to figure out how they could do some hybrid meetings as well. And we're happy to be supportive in any way that we can um, with that. Um, 
And uh, in addition uh, to virtual meetings, Council Member Pinto is going to be hosting in-person office hours in Logan Circle on this Friday um, from 4 to 6 p.m. So we invite everyone to come and join us. Um, if you're able, we know it will be hot. We will continue to um, host office hours and in, in, um, throughout the end of the year. And um, we'll certainly be hosting one in 2C um, in the coming months. I'll also mention that Council Member Pinto introduced the BEST Act, uh, the Business and Entrepreneurship Support to Thrive Amendment Act to streamline business licensing and to support new and existing businesses. Um, the legislation would simplify the basic business license process, reduce fees, um, and create some equity um, in the structure of how that is done. So we're very excited with that and we are hoping that it, the legislation will receive a hearing in the fall. In addition, um, as you may know, we are in the throes of budget season and the first big vote will be happening on July 20th, um, uh, followed by two additional votes on August 3rd and August 10th. Um, there are a number of great budget wins for Ward 2 already in the budget, but if there are things that um, are continue to be a concern for you, please reach out to our office. Some of the things that Councilmember Pinto is going to continue fighting for include per permanent supportive housing vouchers for our neighbors experiencing homelessness, additional Cure the Streets violence interruption program locations, relief for excluded workers, and excluded workers are those who um, are out of work but do not qualify for unemployment benefits through the government, um, as well as rent relief for small businesses. And um, she's working hard on those issues. And if there's um, additional things that are priorities for you, we want to hear from you. So you can always email or call me. Um, I'll also mention um, that we have learned from uh, the Department of Human Services that they will be extending the time that uh, they will be using the legacy Pat Handy shelter site. And we've shared a number of concerns that we have with that decision and um, have not received a response yet, but we'll be following up and I'll be working with Joe Florio on trying to get some answers and, and some clarification. Um, so, uh, First and foremost, the biggest concern we have is that this building is not safe for human habitation. <laughs> the women were moved out of the building because it wasn't safe and that uh, you know, construction was imminent and needed to happen quickly. And so that's our first uh, priority is uh, to figure out what's going on um, with the safety of the building and the people who would need to use that as shelter. Another concern that we've shared is um, how this will delay the construction timeline. And uh, third, uh, just continuing to address the concerns that we've heard from neighbors about cleanliness and safety. And so we want you, the commissioners and neighbors to know that this is something that is um, on our radar and we will be working with the mayor's office to get some answers and to address these concerns. Um, so I will pause there and I'm happy to answer questions or take notes and get answers for you at a later time. I would just quickly say, I assume in, in making that presentation about the shelter, it all, you are also advocating for uh, safe relocation of the current um, residents there and whatnot. I'm sure you are, but I just wanna emphasize that. Yes, absolutely. Our primary concern is to get folks into housing and that's something that's been a priority for council member Pinto since before taking office, whether it's folks that are staying in shelter or in encampments, that's certainly the priority. And, and when housing isn't available, then safe shelter is uh, the priority as well. Thank you. And uh, this um, Pat Handy, the legacy slate extension, uh, I believe came up on Friday uh, Thursday or Friday uh, of last week, if I remember correctly. And um, we posed a number of questions uh, to GHS, like uh, Genevieve has indicated, um, and we have not received um, responses uh, to those as of yet. Um, 
So I have uh, two hands that have emerged and uh, Doug O'Connor. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you fine. Um, ooh, I'll be ooh. quick. I just want to say thank you, first of all, to all the parties here who have done so much to help us uh, deal with the problems that we're experiencing as a result of this. It's both uh, the ANC, uh, Council Member Pinto's office, Joe Florio, especially, and the bid have been really, really remarkable. And so um, the second point I'll make is that I have pressed on this more and more explicitly in my communications with DHS and Mr. Smith. Uh, we have seen no actions of any kind, no plans, no timelines, no suggestions, literally nothing for months of conversation. And uh, I, I will just say that the residents here are despondent um, in, in the face of that. It's really, it's really hard. It's really frustrating. We had a new resident here who moved into the building just this weekend, really happy to live here, immediately suffered a break in. Uh, from her boyfriend's car and is regularly threatened and intimidated right outside of our building. And her landlord advised her to practice running, practicing getting into the building through the back door in the alley. <laughs> it's, I mean, this is ridiculous. So um, that all said, we are sensitive to, we live in a, in a complex web and community and we, we are in support of taking care of the homeless. I mean, we've put up flowers to beautify the area and, and make it nicer. The bid has really helped us clean things up. It's made a gigantic impact. We really, really want to see DHS step up to the plate. And um, if anyone from DHS is here tonight, I'd love to hear what they have to say. That's my piece. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doug. And um, I, I know that this is remains an ongoing issue. And um, it's very much of a concern for all of us when we receive that email. Um, on Friday without resolutions to any of the challenges that we had uh, um, heard or solutions that we had proposed. Um, and I, by the way, I do like your, your, your flower arrangements on the, the sidewalk there. I was over there last night. Um, we had, had, um, we had um, Reginald Black, um, your hand was up next. And then we have Commissioner Nelson. Reginald, are you there? You're on mute. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there yes, you go. I, there you I go, am. Sir. I, uh, yeah, I, um, I was having connectivity issues. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you fine. All right, cool. Um, so, so I did have a, a question to, uh, Ms. Genevieve about that, um, about the legacy site. So, and I, this is the first I've heard of the extension, um, because what I was, um, what some of our partners have been talking about is supporting uh, extending the uh, preparatory, I mean, the uh, pandemic emergency program for highly vulnerable individuals, PEPV, in which uh, persons who have, have exceptional medical vulnerabilities are able to access a hotel room for, for the time being until uh, we can either identify more proper shelter placement or housing placement for them. So I'm wondering if, um, if there, the council member has had conversations with anyone about this, and I would encourage neighbors to also join with partners like the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless in calling for the extension and hopefully uh, if we can push hard enough creation of a, uh, at least another PEP site. I know we want to try to keep two of them open so that we don't have a influx of people uh, flowing into homelessness. And the legacy site was only open because of the 68% capacity caps the DHS wanted to put in there to protect residents from contracting COVID. Those produced very low shelter utilization, which we found was more advantageous in, me in, in mitigating the virus and making sure that, you know, people felt safe going into shelter. So I just want to emphasize that point and mm -hmm. that, you know, we can also try to extend PEP V as a solution to some of this. It, it, is that, are you saying PEP, P-E-P-V? Yes, P-E-P-V, okay. yeah. Pandemic Emergency Program for Highly Vulnerable cool. Individuals. Got it. PEP Thank V, you. for sure. PEP V, yeah. I gotcha, gotcha. Thank you very much for that comment. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Black. I can comment if you'd like, Commissioner Schinkel. Please, please. Or thank Chairman. You. Um, I think Joe might be able to talk to this more fluidly, but my understanding is that the priority for DHS is to move folks who are in pet fee shelter into housing, um, knowing that they are medically vulnerable and uh, to ensure that they are prioritized for vouchers and moved into housing. Uh, my understanding is that um, the pet fee program is um, expected to end at the end of September, which is the end of the fiscal year, based on um, uh, some coronavirus relief funds from the federal government and using um, FEMA funds for those resources. So I know that I, my understanding is that it's the priority of DHS to move people from hotels into permanent housing um, and certainly um, understand um, that it, it has been a priority to make sure that people feel safe going into shelter. Um, again, Joe might be able to expand upon this, but um, my understanding is that the shelter vaccination rates have been um, have been going well and that people have been able to access vaccines. So um, the transmission rates are very low, um, not only in shelters right now, but across the city. So I don't know if Joe has anything to add there. Nothing if to I add, but, really um, oh, sorry. Sorry, if I may really quick, could you uh, share with me what are some of the vaccination numbers that have been shared with the council member? People that have been asking how much of the unhoused community been vaccinated, you know, minus any staff or anybody in those numbers. So I don't know if they have shared that with you, but could you share that with us? Sure, I'd have to follow up on that. Um, Mr. Black, I don't have that in front of me, but I'd be happy to share with you um, or with the commission, um, the ANC, what, what we do have access to. Yeah, if you want to report on that next meeting as well, you could feel free to email anyone in the meantime, but I'd be interested in that as well. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Commissioner Nelson. Sorry. I was just, no problem. I was just going to say that I did speak to uh, Melvin Smith today and he is amenable to attending one of our meetings to discuss you know, the concerns of the residents. That's all. Great, great, thank you. I appreciate also, that. Joe, did, you, did you have a follow-up um, a moment ago? I think you may have gotten cut off. Did you have something to say as well? I'm sorry, who are you speaking to? Joe Florio, oh, I thought yeah. he, he was responding as well to the question, sorry. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, uh, Genevieve covered it, but I am taking notes on this conversation that we're having. So that's all I have to add. Great. Just wanted to check in. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you for that, um, that update, Genevieve. Appreciate that very much. Um, do we have anybody from MPG1 um, on the phone with that? Oh, terrific. And George, uh, Donegan? That's that's really good. Yep. George oh. Donegan here. Oh, that's great. Oh, I'm usually a horrible name pronouncer. <laughs> great job. So terrific. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm Lieutenant Donegan. I've um, been at 1D for about two years now, but just recently got moved over to um, the ANC 2C area of, um, of the district. So um, Captain Duro is, is on uh, working in the mornings now. So since I'm here, um, letting him uh, have the night off um, to join you. Um, so I'll just dive right in, um, just a quick overview of our, um, the East of Ninth Street um, crime stats just for the last month. Um, overall, it's looking uh, pretty good, um, especially compared to last year. Um, burglaries and thefts are uh, down dramatically compared to last year. Um, Obviously, uh, there, the uh, civil unrest last year kind of led to that spike in the burglaries, and it's it's fairly normalized essentially. Um, the um, as more retail establishments have opened, um, the retail thefts have increased. Um, it's something we probably were expecting, um, where the 2020 um, or the the effects of COVID 19 are, are diminishing, which is good. Um, 
unfortunately it means there's some, you know, an increase in the shoplifting uh, type of activity. Um, and that's seen throughout the city really. Um, so that's where um, the theft is happening. Um, as far as uh, violent crime goes, we only have one um, to discuss on the uh, first district side. Um, and that was a um, assault with a dangerous weapon involving a knife. Um, it occurred in the 600 block of H Street Northwest on the 4th of July. Um, that's one where victim's not too cooperative with explaining what happened. Um, he may be someone who is experiencing homelessness. Um, and after some type of an argument, um, he wound up um, sustaining a laceration. He then walked to the fire station um, down on uh, F Street and was taken to hospital um, where he's, um, he's okay and recovering. Um, and again, we just really don't have much on the backstory. There's um, some surveillance footage that we were able to get um, to put a, um, for the officers to identify a suspect um, in the area. Um, so that's basically it um, as far as my report out, but I would love to hear your concerns and any questions. Um, was, was there, a, a, I'm not sure if this is MPD one, um, but a shooting at um, second in Massachusetts on Sunday? Yes, well, close. Um, okay. Yeah, and I realized I, I'm actually, I'm looking at the map. I'm, I'm still trying to learn the no, a, that's my fine. new ANC boundaries. Um, yeah, so- And um, I, know that, I know that's not our ANC, it's just bordering the ANC there. Right, I'm, I'm looking at the, on the map on, on the, uh, the split screen here. And um, yeah, it was, it was just outside, so I'm sorry it wasn't on the, uh, a little briefing sheet here, but um, yeah, so um, Sunday, uh, right around five o'clock, four thirty, five o'clock, um, in at the corner of Second and E Street Northwest, um, there was a shooting. Um, an adult male um, had just walked to his car. Another vehicle pulled up that seems like they knew um, the the people knew each other, and the person in the vehicle that pulled up. Um, shot the person um, in, the, in the first car uh, a few times. He was taken to hospital, um, non-life-threatening injuries. And um, again, a, uh, we have good video of the incident as well as the um, suspect's vehicle. We don't really have a good backstory on what happened, why, or who did it from the victim himself, um, which of course makes things a little difficult. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, commissioners, do you have any other questions for MPD one? Awesome. Do community folks for MPD one? All right. Terrific. I don't. Oh, go ahead. Doug. Doug. Uh, sorry. Uh, my question is, what can I tell the residents of my building? in regards to improving the safety on our block and in our neighborhood? What, what are the kinds of actions that we should be taking? Well, that's, that's a, a fairly, fairly broad question. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I mean, so one, one just, just in general, oh, sorry, there's some echo on the audio. Um, big thing when anyone's out, um, walking on the street is to, you know, get out of the phone, pay attention to your surroundings. Um, it's kind of general, I guess, really life advice, hopefully. Um, paying attention to your surroundings. If something feels off, trust your instincts. Um, with your car, always lock it, turn it off um, so that people don't hop in and take it. Um, removing valuables from view um, to try to minimize the appeal for somebody to break in um, and take property from there. Um, what, what locking your doors. doors. In terms of how to yeah. engage with uh, the, the police or not. I know a lot of my residents are really uncomfortable calling the police unless it's an incredibly serious witness like direct uh, crime. Um, that's something we've been encouraged to do a lot, but there's a lot of resistance and discomfort in my community to that. So in terms of building a safer neighborhood, I'm not just talking about like personal hygiene uh, and personal safety decisions. Like what can we do more of as a community to like engage with all of you 
so that these things are less likely to occur where we live. It's a different angle on that question that I wasn't anticipating. Um, it's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm gonna I'll put my email in the chat if you wanna if you don't mind emailing me so we can uh, discuss more about um, some kind of event or get together or something. But um, generally speaking, to kind of the fear of calling 911 or you know where someone might ask themselves, is this worth making the call? Um, I hope that even with the, the national discussion about policing, especially over the last year, I hope there's still um, a good level of trust that MPD is not other agencies um, or not Milwaukee. Um, hopefully we have that trust um, where, you know, 911 takes every call that comes mm -hmm. in. The Office of Unified Communications really doesn't screen what comes in. Um, and they dispatch it out. And a lot of things that come in, the officers or the supervisors and managers can recognize that that's not a police matter and we're not going to get involved, um, which hopefully helps reduce or should hopefully help reduce the fear of calling is that we're, you know, we make, we evaluate we don't just rush in, we evaluate the information that comes in to make sure that it is something that our response would be lawful um, and appropriate. And then we also um, are heavily reliant on making sure that, um, for example, if there's somebody experiencing a mental health crisis, that we are reaching out to uh, DBH and the crisis response team to try to bring them in if they're available. If they're not available, still do what we can to make sure the person is, is <clears throat> safely taken to where they can get the help they need um, without taking them to jail or anything like that. I, I appreciate what you're saying and I'm happy to take this offline with you guys. I'll, I'll just say that there's a natural incentive born into some of these conversations where when someone complains about a, a safety or sanitation problem, if there isn't a 911 call or a, a paper trail of data to back that up, it's talked about as being anecdotal and so then there's this incentive to overreport or place the burden of reporting on the residents to sort of like supervise and, and sort of surveillance state everything that's going on, which is something we really want to avoid. But at the same time, we understand that you have to respond to where the data leads you. So um, I'll just leave that issue there and I'm happy to continue the conversation uh, out of this meeting. Thank you. And I, I think that's a, a great point, uh, Doug, that you bring up about around data and usage of data. And I know that we've, we've talked previously around uh, th dialing 311, the emergency line, the non-emergency line, and that does get directed over to uh, the same uh, communications area that 911 comes out of. So when they answer their phone, they would like, what is your emergency kind of uh, response? Um, and I know that um, earlier this evening, Joe had mentioned the uh, 311 numbers, uh, 311 uh, reporting numbers. Um, what I have found with 311 is as they farm out the request to the various agencies, you as the person submitting that request may get a, a slip that or an email saying that your request has been resolved or closed um, instead of having an action like, oh, we fixed the sidewalk or we fixed the sign or whatever. Um, and that typically means that it's been referred over to a, an agency for data tracking. But the 311 data is utilized um, for a lot of, of efforts in the city. Um, I don't want any of your the residents of uh, Strict Street Flats or or any resident anywhere in the city having any kind of fear, leaving their, their house, going to their car, et cetera. And, and I think that uh, MPD you know, should be utilized and, um, and called as, as a, a first line, maybe I would say that, of, of um, response um, if there's not another service available uh, for that. Um, yes. Um, well, I have a hand up from uh, Mr. Black. Uh, 
So, um, so yeah, I'm here. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> as far as some of the uh, some of the things that can be supported, there is the public restroom, public facilities, uh, installation and promotion act that people can take a look at in terms of the hygienic support. Um, and I did have a conversation with uh, a, a particular neighbor. I don't know if she's a commissioner or not, but one of the things that came out of that was, is there a way to start having uh, outside of this public meeting, informational sessions, especially on, uh, you know, what services and what, um, what the city has planned to alleviate housing stability or, or homelessness, as we would call it, um, and to tackle that in a in like a you know episodic fashion, in which each you know question could be answered one at a time, and these and these uh, sessions can take place you know on a rotating basis um, continually, and so we can have specific questions that you know, folks want answered and I can, you know, assist with educating people mm -hmm. um, and suggesting other forums people can go to, to have that education. But I don't know if the commission has talked about that or where we are with that. I know I had one conversation with, with someone about two hours, but that was the main idea is to take some of these burning questions from the neighbors and one at a time do like, you know, uh, 60 to 90 minute info sessions on them in an episodic fashion so that we continue uh, that that conversation about housing instability in the kit in the uh, in the commission, because this particular commission has a very transient area, which is Chinatown and a lot of unhoused people frequent and, and transit through there, accessing different services all across the city including shelter, meal programs, and the downtown mm -hmm. service center. So I'm interested in having those sessions. Um, I don't know where we are with them. And I would suggest that, that, that we start trying to work on that. In addition to people taking a look at the Public Facilities Installation and Promotion Act and uh, encouraging some adoption of some of those policies that uh, businesses can uh, uh, engage in as far as uh, hygienic support for those who are on hand. Thank you for that. I do appreciate that. And that is something that we want to try to do offline of these meetings so that we can get into more in-depth uh, discussions about, about these um, topics that are really important and, you know, impact a wide variety of individuals um, in our community. Um, and uh, I would just add, Reginald, if you have it, I think I've heard you speak before about a couple different organizations you um, work with. If you want to email me some resources, because I'd love to loop in people who are a little more um, expert in the area, I wouldn't want to, you know, take on answering some of these questions without without some input with those folks. So um, I, definitely, I definitely can do that. But uh, they will tell you the same thing I'm going to say because I have the lived experience. Um, I'm the expert. They kind of like follow my lead. But yes, I do have right. a lot of organizations I work with um, as far as this issue. Um, you know, those that work with mental health, substance use, housing. So, yes, I'm down to bringing, them up, bringing my coalition partners along for the ride. Um, we, we do sessions together all the time. Matter of fact, we just did one about chronic homelessness about no more than an hour ago. Um, so I'm down to do that. A lot right. of them are ward two residents, some of them two C, some of them not. So yeah, I'm down to have those types of conversations. Um, and uh, if you can uh, chat me your email address, um, we can connect and try to figure out what types of resources um, you would like to you would like to access in your area. I have that kind of information. That sounds great. I'll, I'll do that now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Donegan. I really appreciate you being here tonight uh, for us. Um, is anybody from MPD2 
President. Uh, excuse me, um, I'm supposed to give one community outreach event. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. Lindia Johnson is, uh, is with us and uh, she is the community um, outreach specialist for MPD1. Yeah. Is that correct? Terrific. Yeah. And I'll let you do your introduction. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry. I, no. My, my name is Lydia Johnson. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for 1D. Um, been in, in MPD about 17 years, but just re, uh, just transported to from 7D to 1D. So uh, I just want to bring you a couple of events that we're going to be doing in 1D. And I know you guys have heard about the Beat the Streets. Uh, we have about three of those plans for 1D. Starting tomorrow, there's going to be one at the wharf from 1 to 5. I believe that uh, the, the wharf is in your area, maybe. Um, and then we have th that's the wharf 700 Main. Then we have one on Thursday at Greenleaf um, area, 1300 block of Half Street Southwest. That's going to be 1 to 5. And then not, the last one is... Um, at the Greenleaf Rec Center, which is 201 N Street, and that's on the 17th. And I'll post these in the chat. But the, the, another announcement is that the, the district has a Keeping It Clean initiative, part of the Green Team uh, Strategic Change Division. And on this Friday from 1 to 4, they'll be doing some cleaning in the 1300 block of K Street Southeast. So any volunteers who want to go and help out, we would appreciate that. And then on August the 3rd, we'll be hosting National Night Out um, at, for 1D at Lincoln Park from 5 to 8 at uh, 13th and East Capitol Street. We have food, fun, networking. And also we're going to post in the link, if any of you have resource vendors that may want to participate in National Night Out, you can just go ahead and fill them in on this form. And finally, we're not quite finally, um, um, Chief of Police Conti has asked us to spread the word about the DC getting uh, recruiting DC residents ages 17 to 24 to serve as MPD cadets. The starting salary for cadets is 34,432, and that includes a paid education of two years from the University of the District of Columbia while they work here at MPD. And finally, I just wanted to say that the city also has. Um, applications for leaf um, season um, coming up. And you can, people can apply in person at the Reeves Center through Friday from 9.30 to 3.30. And then um, they can do it online starting Monday through the end of the month. So that's what I have to say. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Johnson. That is that's very well, helpful. All right. And you're going to put some of that information. Yeah, I'm going to put it chat. in the chat right now. That's awesome. Fun. Thank you so much. I got to go to 6B. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Is uh, anyone from uh, MPD2 present? Awesome. Okay, um, we will move uh, forward um, with local events that impact the community. Um, the first on our agenda is support for public arts project in 2C. Um, Catherine Watt, the deputy director for arts and programs and chief curator of the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Are you present? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you fine, thank okay, you. Okay, great, I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Uh, let's see, yep, there you go. Okay. Okay, um, I'm excited to share with you this evening a planned uh, public art project at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, uh, which is located at the intersection of New York Avenue and H and 13th Streets. Um, and you might have heard, starting on August 9th, um, in just a few weeks, we will be closing the building to the public to begin a two-year renovation project. Um, so in January 2022, scaffolding will be positioned over the museum's 
west facade. So that's what you're seeing there. There's the short end of the building. And this is the side of the building that faces into that very wide intersection at H and 13th and New York Avenue. And for those of us who work in art museums, that, that blank, um, huge expanse of scaffolding is like a sort of like a blank canvas for us. And we hope to commission a brand new work of art to be printed on scrim, right? The breathable fabric that covers uh, scaffoldings and um, the art will, will be up for about as long as the scaffolding. So from late March through September of next year. We are partnering with local artist Sita Sedeli, whose artist name is Miss Shalov. She is a highly experienced muralist. She most often works with paint and brush or spray paint, as you see here. Uh, and she has experience working at large scale. So this is her mural, might be familiar to some of you, yes. on the exterior of Hotel Zena at Thomas Circle, right here in Ward 2. And you can see, um, if you count the windows there, that the uh, figures in this work measure about six stories in height. But Ms. Shalav uh, has also created designs specifically to be printed on scrim or breathable fabric. So she's an artist who understands about color saturation and porosity as it relates to scrim. And she, if you look at the picture on the right, she's that little itty-bitty figure at the lower right in a pink tank top, uh, standing with one of the fabric covered towers that she designed for the 2017 uh, Folk Life Festival. So when I called Ms. Shalev about this project, I said, you've worked with big space, we've got big space and space that can command this large juncture in DC. What would you envision for this? And here's what she developed. Uh, an image of a woman with traditional Javanese embellishment, the jewelry, the makeup with her hands, you can see in poses reminiscent of Javanese dance. She's surrounded by leaves and flowers that are native to the islands of Indonesia. Miss Shalav's mother was an immigrant to Washington DC from Indonesia. And the artist is expressing an embrace of her family's Javanese culture, but the work also reflects on the pandemic. All of those botanical elements reference the resurgence of nature during the pandemic. So we've all heard the stories about how when most of us were hiding in our homes, dirty rivers cleared up, mm -hmm. uh, smog lifted from city skies, animals ventured out into habitats uh, that they lost many years ago. So this figure is intended to emblematize Mother Earth too. But she also represents all women because Ms. as Ms. Shalev notes, women are increasingly involved in social and political change, including change related to the environment. Uh, here you can see uh, Ms. Shalev's image to scale on the scaffolding that will be covering our building's west facade. It'll be a little more than six stories in height. And um, we call our project Lookout, Ms. Shalev at the new National Museum of Women in the Arts because we're inviting people to certainly look out for what the museum is doing while the building is closed, as well as what's coming up for us once we reopen. And we're calling it Lookout because this statuesque figure is like a sentry, a guardian uh, over our neighborhood, looking out over the space and the people who live and work here. Um, of course, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. If you want to reach out to me later, my contact information is on the screen and I'll also put it in the chat, of course. Terrific. Um, are you looking for um, a letter of support? Yes, I am. For this project? And yes. that would go to G dot? Um, or? This is, uh, we're applying uh, to the DCCAH uh, oh. Public Art Building Communities grant program. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, got yeah. it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, terrific. So it's to the grant program. Yes. Got it. Um, are there any uh, commissioners, do you have any questions or comments? No. Well, I just wanna say that I am really excited that somebody is taking advantage of this stuff around the scaffolding. <laughs> what is it called? Uh, it's, well, it's, we, I call it scrim, but in the, in the industry it's called breathable fabric. So oh, it's just that's, breathable that's fabric. Breathable fabric, yeah. 
I, I have often said like, why don't they put something on that, that that values the community or reflects the community? And I love that this is a, a this is being utilized here um, at the Museum of the Women in the Arts, which I think is fantastic and really reflective of the, the uh, organization. So I'm, I'm excited to see that. Thank you, Commissioner. It means a lot. Appreciate that. Do you know if it's um, if the actual piece, once the construction is done, if it's going to be able to be preserved at all, or if you're going to memorialize it with photography or anything like that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Commissioner, we plan um, a lot of archival photography. Um, we will also be doing sort of a digital walking tour so you can go and see other works by the artist. She has created um, artworks in, I think, seven of the eight wards in Washington, D.C. So she's, she's um, quite prolific. Um, so yes, it'll be recorded in that way. And we also have something kind of cool planned um, because she is so interested in the environment. Um, she is very interested in having us recycle part of this scrim to sort of make tote bags or things like that. Mm -hmm. So we're working with our retail manager here at the museum um, on that initiative as well. That's great. That's really Thank awesome. You. And uh, your, if I remember correctly, your application is due soon. -ish. Yes, fr Friday. She said Friday. she could leave. <laughs> Yes. Got it. Got it. Okay. Terrific. Um, do, are there any questions from the community? Awesome. Um, I, I like to move that we send a letter of support um, for this project in the National Museum of the Women in the Arts. Second. That's seconded by Gigi. And all in those in favor? Terrific. So three or three commissioners uh, voted in favor of that. Um, we will uh, get that out and I will send you, I think you have to submit the letter with your grant application. Yes. So correct. I'll send that over to you uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, commissioners and community. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. And thank you for doing this. It's fantastic. Um, I would... Um, Next, like to uh, call support for public art projects in 2C, uh, Galen Brooks, uh, Director of Planning for Downtown DC Bid, um, and Lisa Marie um, Thalmhammer, um, the artist uh, in this process. Thank you so much, Chair Schenkel. Um, I am Galen Brooks. I'm the Director of Planning and Placemaking for the Downtown DC Business Improvement District. Um, not to be redundant, but got to do it. So we're going to share a little bit about our plan for public art as well. Um, and of course, Lisa Marie is here to dive into those details. But before we do that, I just wanted to share one piece of information related to some of the comments earlier. Um, the Downtown Day Services Center is offering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine on Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to noon and has been making it a priority to vaccinate homeless individuals. So I just wanted to make sure that folks were aware of that uh, that's happening at the Downtown Day Services Center every Wednesday from 9 a.m. to noon. Thank you for that. Let's so to get back to the agenda item at hand, as you may recall, we came to you or I came last month to the meeting to share our proposal for a public art project in downtown DC. Um, we are doing a series of murals by women, celebrating women, with a particular focus on pioneering women who have had a connection to the district. And so Lisa Marie Thalhammer is a fabulous local visual artist who I know I talked a little bit about last time, but I've had the pleasure of working with on a couple of projects now, and she is the lead artist and curator for this project. So we wanted to um, invite her to come and talk to you all today a little bit more about the theme and content for this project. Lisa, you wanna take it away? Sure, hi everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, I think last month when Galen presented, I was like in the middle of doing the lawn art project at the National Building Museum, which it was a 20,000 square foot uh, lawn art painting. So I apologize for not being able to be here uh, last month, but I just want, I know everybody is really busy. You have a big agenda, but I just wanted to say hello and kind of just share with you a little bit 
about kind of where we're going uh, with this project. So uh, curatorially, we're kind, we're kind of going with in the direction of ladies first, uh, kind of playing off kind of the traditional idea of like ladies kind of coming first and looking at women who actually work kind of first and doing something uh, really interesting and historic uh, and women who have a relationship to the district. Uh, so the project's at 1307 New York Avenue, uh, which I can, I think I can share my, my, I'm not, you know, I can share some images here. Let me try to do this. There you go. You got it. And you guys see that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that is... I get a little kind of confused sometimes when I'm doing these, these screen shares, but um, you can kind of see the, the block there of where the project will be located at 1307. You can actually, you know, see Catherine Museum there, the National Museum of Women of the Arts. So that's kind of an exciting um, connection there. So we have also been in touch about the project and it was really fun to see the presentation of CETA's work. So we're really excited about that also kind of being in conversation with what we're doing here. Uh, this is um, more of a permanent project. So we're hoping that the murals, you know, stay up for, I believe it's five years is what they say for, um, as far as like a permanent uh, project for this public art building communities grant. Um, and we're working with a number of uh, different artists. So back to kind of like the ladies first idea um, right there. This is also the building for the Herald. And I know that their interior lobby is um, going to, you know, it's going to be a really interesting lobby kind of based on some of the stylistic elements of um, Jackie Kennedy. So based on that, we kind of thought, well, you know, it'd be really cool to show some of the pioneering uh, first ladies. So some of the, um, what we're working on is, well, when, one of the women that I'm working on depicting is um, is Jackie Kennedy, kind of fashion icon. Um, you, you know, first really, really involved with uh, the White House and uh, preserving also Lafayette Square. So that was really kind of a big contribution to preserving the historic nature of that whole area of uh, D.C. Then also, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt is just a really you know, fabulous first lady, um, also kind of known as like first lady of the world in tribute to, you know, her human rights achievements. And she was actually the first chairman of the UN Human Rights Commission. And uh, so she led a committee that drafted uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and then also looking at uh, representing uh, Lady Bird Johnson, who was also very involved with the district by her um, beautification efforts of planting flowers along all of our nation's highway, but also especially in uh, the district uh, as well. So, and then additionally, um, I'm working with a number of other artists that so are pulling them in to um, help kind of create these portraits of these, of these women. So, um, Latoya Peoples, who's an art, she's an artist out of Baltimore. We're working with her on a representation of Mary McLeod Bethune, who was also involved with the Roosevelt administration. And um, she was actually one of the highest women of color, black women who um, at, at her time, like in, uh, in, the, in the Roosevelt administration there. And uh, she's also known as a first lady as well. Um, Additionally, uh, Nia Calhoun is a DC based local artist and we're working with her on doing a portrait of Shirley Chisholm, who is the first black woman elected to the United States Congress. And then another artist, um, Wing Chow based in Richmond, Virginia. And we are working with her on a depiction of uh, Patsy Mink, who was the first um, woman of color in the house and also first Asian American, and she uh, was a representative from Hawaii. So um, really looking to have a, a multicultural, diverse depiction of women, diverse group of women artists working on the project. Um, and is there anything else that I- No, that's to, great. I, I know we now? have a five minute limit, so I, oh, okay. I don't wanna go Sorry. over it. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, 
the one thing I'll just emphasize is that it's all artists that are local to the region. Lisa Marie, obviously yourself, you're here. Um, yes. And then the we have two artists live in the district as well, and another two are you know in the greater DC region. So definitely focusing on local, both in the artwork um, and in the artists that are participating as well. So thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. I know that this is um, something near and dear to our hearts, um, the downtown bid and focus on public space and the enrichment of the community and vibrancy, but also celebration of histories that don't get as much attention, especially in contrast. I think we talked about this last time, but to a lot of the um, statues and memorialization of other people in history. Um, it's wonderful to take advantage of the opportunity to celebrate folks who don't get celebrated as often. Great, thank you both so very much for coming back and for um, presenting this. I know there was some question last time about who was going to be uh, be depicted in this, this work and we really uh, appreciate you uh, conceptualizing that, Lisa, and, and coming back with that. Um, that's totally great. And this is an awesome location um, that has visibility from the street as well as people are walking. It's not secluded in any way uh, for that. So I do, I think that's gonna be great. I'm excited and, to see it. And we did, just to mention it, we did also work with the DC History Center so we've collaborated with them on the selection of women to feature. That's great. Yeah, and we're looking also to install this during Women's History Month in March. We think that'd be a really nice um, mm -hmm. time to do it. So, um, and then the DC History Center is actually gonna be having a, um, not, a conven um, not a convention, a, com a conference at the Martin Luther King Library that first in April, so it'll be a nice time to kind of like do tours and to and to um, you know have some educational public programming also around the creation of the murals. That'd be great. Would yeah, you see fun. Would you see that as being a live kind of activity? Like you would encourage people to come by as you were doing the the mural itself. People always come by, yeah. you know, when you're doing it. So yeah, sure, yes, definitely, yeah, come come by and. And say hi for sure. That's part great. Of, it's part of the experience, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if if there are some um, formal events you want to announce at our meeting in February or whatever, just um, reach back out. And if there's any corresponding like online or something component with info or about the um, women being depicted, we could always circulate that kind of thing. So feel free to reach out again when it gets to be that time. That's wonderful. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank That's you great. so much. Um, and uh, Galen, I did uh, send the letter of support for you from the commission last time. Do you need any other documentation or any refinement of that based on, on this discussion? Nope, I don't believe okay. so. Thank you. Awesome. Terrific. Well, th any questions from community? Awesome. Terrific. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate you both being here and discussing this. It was another, fun to chat with much. you guys. Another yeah, you. great art project. Yay. <laughs> thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda um, is Bike Ride DC, which is scheduled for September 25th, 2020. And um, Diane Romo Thompson. Thomas. Thomas. Hi. Oh, yes. Thomas. Thomas. No I'm problem. sorry. I I put the <laughs> the post sum on it. <laughs> yeah, no it's problem. My colleague, terrific, not, Diane. Not the Thomas. first time. <laughs> awesome. So, real quickly, I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. The DC bike ride. This traditionally has happened in May for the last several years um, because of COVID last year. Um, of course, that didn't happen. And with COVID this year, it got pushed back a little bit. So the event this year is on a Saturday again, uh, September 25th. Um, the event it runs a 20 mile bike ride with an option to cut off at seven miles if you can't do the 20, but it's a ride, it's not a race. That's very important. This is kids, seniors, families, um, definitely um, family friendly. Um, this ANC in particular is going to be hosting the Finish Line Festival. 
So I think I sent the map ahead of time. I can put it up if people need to see it, but really just the ANC limit to focus for you guys is Maryland Avenue, that 300 block of Maryland Avenue. So your ANC is gonna host all the finishers who are done with the ride. Yep, Oops. there it is. Yep. So right there after mile 19, they'll finish up. So it kind of borders there on independence and then finishes right there. The field, I, we don't know about the field this year. We're thinking maybe 5,000 bikers. A lot of people who didn't race in 19 and 20 were allowed to come back in 21. So I don't think they expect more than about 5,000 uh, riders this year with all the safety uh, that the city requires with the sanitation, the pre-screening, um, the distancing of the bikes. So that will still remain intact as well um, for this event. Um, but the neat thing about, to me, as a DC resident, the neatest thing about this, that it, the proceed that supports the Mayor's Vision Zero program and the WABA, our Washington Area Bicycle Association, to fund their programs on bike safety and all the programs they're doing here in the city. So that's it in a nutshell for the bike ride. I actually did the 2017 one. I, I, I wrote it, yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, hope you come back in 21. <laughs> is the, um, I, yeah, I'm plan I haven't bought the ticket yet, but I am planning okay. to. Is the, is the finish line the same setup that it typically is, the same area? Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we used Third Street last year, so it's Maryland, and they kind of end at Maryland, then you go up Third. I think they use the, the length of Third Street. Mm -hmm. Awesome. This is great. And I'm happy to see events coming back yeah. um, after this long absence that we've had. Yep. Yes, indeed. Are there, um, and this has been going on since 2016, I believe? 16 was the first year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, terrific. That is awesome. Um, any additional questions for Diane? I would like to move, we send a letter of support uh, for uh, bike, the DC bike ride. Second. All those in favor? Okay, terrific. Awesome. Diane, and that goes to the mayor's- Can you, Task force. Yep, task special force, events yes. task force. Yep. Yep, got it. And I'll mm -hmm. copy you on that. Okay. All right. And, and then also, you have another one that's coming up here. That's coming back. Yeah. Right, yay. And Which that is You guys the, have hosted the start line. <laughs> yeah. That is the rock and roll. Yep, just the half. half marathon this year, no marathon, just the half. So it'll be a little smaller in, in scope as it was in previous years. But you guys will once again host the start line right there at 15th and Constitution. Um, the corrals will run from 14th Street and they will end right past 10th Street. So we will not impact 9th Street. That traffic will flow. Um, during the, the morning. Now the first runner, it starts at 8.30 for the kickoff. That last runner will clear Constitution by 9.30. Now the closure will be till noon only to break down the structures and to clean that those corrals out of the way. Um, but other than that, that's the only thing you'll see. We don't loop back, we don't come back around and the field size will probably, traditionally was about 18,000. They're probably expecting 10 this year as we return. Mm -hmm. And they'll be spreading the corrals out for the distancing and the timing, but that's it in a nutshell. Great, and, and that's starting at, is that the, starting the, at Freedom Plaza? No, no, it starts at 14th and Constitution oh, and it finishes at RFK. Yeah, it finishes at RFK. Got it. And goes all through the, the city. I'll just project a map here for folks to see. For us, we're starting like right it here. Is. Awesome. Terrific. And 10,000 runners, you say? Yes. Awesome. When will your setup begin? Would that be the day before? 3 a.m. 3 3 Got mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So it's a closure of that particular stretch of Constitution Oops. from 3 a.m. till about noon. Got it. Are there any questions for the rock and roll half marathon? I'd like to move that we send a letter of support, um, supporting uh, the rock and roll, uh, rock and roll uh, marathon half ma <laughs> that the, <laughs> the rock and roll half marathon. Is there a second? Second. And all those in favor? 
Awesome. Terrific. Three of three commissioners voting. Great. In favor of. Thank you very much, Diane. Right. Thank you, commissioners. Virtually, Appreciate we'll it. Get that off to, Hope oh, to see you sorry. out there running and biking. <laughs> Yay. You no. might see me biking. You won't see okay. me running. No sorry. running. You and me <laughs> both. <laughs> Thank you. We are, um, we've already, um, we have removed the uh, national capital, Pepco Capital Grid uh, project update. And next on our agenda is the 2021 Downtown DC on Wheels and uh, Mike Berman, president of Diverse Markets Management. Mike, hi Mike. Hi guys, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, getting us on your agenda. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, my name is Mike Berman. I'm uh, with Diverse Markets Management. We produce the uh, Downtown Holiday Market, which will be coming to you soon, may, hopefully the September agenda. But I'm here on behalf of the downtown bid that would like to propose an event on the same uh, area, a closed uh, F Street. This would be the 800 block of F Street. And the event will be called the Downtown DC on Wheels. And it's going to be a roller skating rink uh, with um, a jumbotron screen for some uh, um, movies that are related to uh, roller skating and uh, some other ancillary events. It'll be proposed to be September 17th, 18th and 19th. So that would be a Friday morning setup and uh, it would start uh, to the public uh, Friday evening at four o'clock, run till 11 o'clock um, and then occur again Saturday from noon to 11 and then uh, Sunday uh, from uh, noon to six. And then at 6 p.m. on Sunday night, we would uh, uh, break it all down and Monday morning, the uh, street will be open again. We've uh, presented this uh, to the uh, uh, Homeland Security's uh, Special Events Task Force. Uh, they have reviewed it and have given us conditional approval. Um, so we've addressed um, uh, all their uh, issues and uh, concerns uh, in our plan, which would be to have uh, concrete barriers to block the street, uh, MPD detail to uh, further uh, enhance our security, and um, uh, keeping a 20-foot fire lane in case of any emergency uh, can access F Street as well. Um, we would propose to add a food and beverage vendor uh, there will also be a DJ booth uh, and some uh, picnic tables or uh, seating for people to uh, enjoy the food and beverage. Uh, we do not anticipate uh, alcohol, and uh, we will be looking uh, first to our neighbors uh, at Shake Shack and our surroundings to see if they would like to be our food vendors. Um, if not, we'll certainly um, be working in concert with them to make sure uh, uh, they're happy with uh, whatever we do uh, use, but we would love to uh, incorporate our neighbors uh, to to that extent. Um, we have not yet begun those discussions uh, with our retailers um, or with um, the Smithsonian or Hotel Monaco, uh, but we're not intending to close uh, the 700 block of uh, F Street. So hopefully the Monaco is not impacted at all. Um, that is a discussion with MPD who would still like to um, close the street with their vehicles. Um, so we'll have to see how, how that works out. Um, hopefully, hopefully they're not impacted though. The um, movies, we're hoping to uh, use um, Bluetooth uh, headphones. Uh, so it would be like a silent movie, silent disco uh, headphone styles for the for the movie projections. Um, and then the DJ is uh, having speakers based uh, facing the roller skating rink. So it's for the roller skating. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a DJ booth, uh, not to be uh, so loud as to impact uh, anything beyond that. Uh, there's a skate uh, rink vendor that uh, builds this and supplies it. Uh, they will do skate rental um, booth and there'll be a skate changing area booth. And we will also have an info booth and that's, that's pretty much it. Happy to take any questions. Uh, 
address anybody's concerns. I just have I one just question. Wanted, oh, oh, go sorry. ahead, Ellie. <laughs> uh, is it, this is going to be kind of all ages pop up kind of set up. This isn't like expert. I mostly want to know because I want to go to it um, <laughs> and I'm not very good. So I was just wondering if it's just, you know, walk up whoever, whoever is interested, you could rent skates and whatnot. Yes, it's, it's definitely for all ages. Uh, we do intend to have some skate instructors there, some pros. So they'll do some instructions. I think they'll even do a little bit of uh, a performance. Um, and um, uh, there might even be uh, 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 young uh, skate times uh, Saturday day. We haven't really uh, solidified the programming yet, but. Uh, Great, thank you. Attention. I just wanted to clarify the dates. You said this is gonna be from the 17th through the 19th of September, is that right? That's correct. We had originally proposed uh, August uh, 7th and we've uh, pushed it back to September. Okay, thanks. Well, when I saw this, I was immediately excited and uh, <laughs> that there was a, a roller skating rink uh, coming. Um, so I'm, I'm real excited about it. Um, what about, I'm sure you've thought about this. What about restrooms? I don't see any restrooms on the uh, on the map, there there are some porta johns uh, behind the jumbotron. Uh, is a provisional placement of that. Oh, I see. I see now. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Um, so we will have the porta johns. Um, it could be. I'm not sure, but it could be that the Smithsonian's F Street uh, doors might be open by then. I, I'm mm -hmm. hopeful. Uh, in which case, we would also have access to the museum's uh, restrooms. That's great. Um, did you say this is the first time you guys have done this? Uh, it is. It might even be the first outdoor roller skating rink in the city. So how many people do you expect to attend? Um, we, we're not quite sure. Um, we think it could be popular. However, we also realize September 18th is a H Street Festival. Uh, so we do have a competing event that should take a lot of people away, but uh, I think that's a different crowd. Um, so I think a thousand a day, something to that effect. Are you looking to have this in this same location annually, or would you be moving it around to different places or is this just a one-off? That's a downtown bid question. <laughs> <laughs> I, speak to that. I guess if it's successful, I think it could be an annual event. Um, as, as far as location, um, there is, uh, some desire, uh, to, um, use this block of F street more often, uh, as a, as an event space, as a placemaking okay. location. Okay. But there, if there's other, if there's other streets or other plazas, you know, that, that could be utilized, you know, why not? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think what commissioner Nelson was really asking is how, how fast she can go around the ring when she's <laughs> just, just crowds. That'll be, hey, Michael, that'll be after I get some training from the instructors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think this is a fantastic idea. It, it is like half the footprint of your holiday market um, right. activity. It looks like almost the exact same setup in that half. Um, so, uh, are there any questions from community members or any concerns from community? Then um, is there a motion on the table? Are they asking for a letter of support? Yes, we are. Okay. Move to submit a letter of support for downtown DC in the bike. Okay. Is <laughs> awesome. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. Awesome. Three of three commissioners voting in favor. Terrific. Thank you very much, Mike. And we'll get that off um, to the mayor's task force then. Uh, Thank you so much, commissioners. Approval. This is really great. And I have to figure out an outfit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if we had it in August, it was it was going to be the same weekend as the uh, the Otakon, you know, the anime festival. Oh, 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 wow. <laughs> and that... it would have been costume driven. But now we're in September. 
um, you can choose a costume of your choice. Fabulous. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks Thank so you much, so guys. much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we currently do not have any um, um, alcohol beverage licensing um, um, agenda items tonight, but I would like to bring up that um, the ANC and Mather Studios loft condominiums uh, did reach a settlement agreement with uh, Taste LLC, which is at 916 G Street. Um, that is being, uh, I just received the final copy of that and we'll be um, executing that um, over the next 24 hours. So I'd like to just publicly thank all the parties, all the residents of Mather Studios, um, the uh, business uh, at Taste LLC District Bowls for working together so uh, fantastically to uh, create this settlement agreement. Um, and it's a win-win uh, for our community. If you've not uh, been to Taste LLC or District Bowls, um, at 916 G Street. It's a great outdoor area and uh, great food um, there as well. Just putting that out there. Um, we I'm like sorry to interrupt, uh, Please. Commissioner. Uh, my name is Charles Key. I'm the owner of Hot Thai Restaurant. I yes. thought I was on the agenda. Yes, you're in the agenda in the next section. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's uh, okay. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. No problem. Um, we two are, more before you, if you can't see the agenda. There's two more people before you. Oh, I see. I'm so sorry. That's no, it's okay. okay. Um, we'll now move into transportation and public space. Um, we do have uh, with us tonight um, representatives from DDOT who are going to be speaking about the Ninth Street uh, Protected Bike Lane Project that is underway and I believe that I have George um, Banyan and yeah, Branyan, yeah. That's Branyan, it. Branyan, I'm oh, sorry, thank you. That's all right. And and, and uh, Mike, yeah. Mike, and Mike, yeah. Mike. good no, terrific, awesome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, having us and uh, squeezing us into your uh, full agenda at uh, the last minute. We will try to go as quickly as possible. Let me share my screen. Hopefully this will go well. Uh, right. There you go. All right. Uh, nope. How do I? Ah. So I'm having a little trouble get this. I. If you're looking to make it full screen, I think yeah. you would go to slideshow. Yeah, but it's covered by this panel. Hide, how do I hide this? Here we go. No, that's not it. Uh, there we go, hide the floating controls, that worked. All right. um, now, is it showing the full screen for you all? Um, we're seeing a full screen and your next slide as well. All right, now there's a way to not do that. Can someone remind me? I think you're in presenter view. Uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Right, got it. Whew. Okay. Thank you. I should I should have this figured out by now. Um, yeah. So I'm here with Mike, uh, the uh, bike program specialist, um, who's uh, backing me up and helping with this. Uh, I took over this project uh, oh, oh, after it was revived. The mayor announced. Um, after getting some more information from us, uh, that's that uh, the project that was on hold uh, from 2018 is is started up again. Um, just to, as a way of background, the, the mayor and the council are pushing our 20 by 22 protected bike lane initiative, which is to build 20 miles of protected bike lanes uh, by the end of next year. We are well on our way to doing that. We've built uh, about 10 out of that 20 um, as of today. Um, also, the mayor's 2022 proposed budget um, is, not, is, is adding resources to DDOT again uh, and wants us to do 10 miles of protected bike lanes a year. So I'm not sleeping very well at night, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, you know, an actual order of magnitude. Uh, it took us 10 years to build 10 miles and now we've, we've built 10 in about a year and a half or two. 
Um, and so we're supposed to build 10 in a year uh, going forward. So uh, we have a, uh, so, so this, it's a key uh, component of this because it's um, of those programs because it is a, a fairly long corridor. Uh, so first uh, the agenda quickly is we're gonna talk about our bike way program, uh, some planning background information, the project history uh, very briefly, and then you know spend the most time on key project features, benefits and impacts south of Mass Ave. The project goes from U Street, Florida, all the way down to Pen Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, the project plans we can take a look at quickly and then timeline for next steps. Uh, we love bike lanes. I know many of you do. Uh, they're uh, also good for uh, scooters and other uh, skateboards and other kinds of wheeled conveyances. Uh, a lot of economic benefits, uh, safety benefits, um, uh, and, uh, and, and a network is critical to supporting biking. So this connects a number of existing uh, protected bike lanes. Um, these are protected bike lanes. Many of you probably already know this, but this is a, a bike lane that is physically separated from the travel portion of a roadway, either by flex posts and wheel stops or other concrete separators or a, a line of, of parked cars. Um, and that is mostly the case on 9th Street. Um, why protected bike lanes? They get a lot more people biking. Um, uh, I started biking 20 years ago, and uh, I'm in this little pale green part there uh, under high stress tolerance. I will bike on just about any road, but I only make up about 4 to 7% of the population. What we're trying to get is the other side of that green uh, uh, illustration. We want the 50 to to 56% of people out there who are interested in biking, but they're very concerned. And so what we wanna do is, is uh, create a roadway, uh, a bike facility on a roadway that makes uh, people from literally from eight to 80 feel comfortable about riding. And that's how we've gotten uh, up to uh, six to 7% of all work trips uh, pre-COVID, uh, we were up to six to 7% of all DC residents commuting by bike. Uh, which was is uh, a massive change from say the year 2000 when it was about a half a percent or three quarters of one. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we are one of the reasons we're doing that is um, the sustainability goals uh, for the district. Um, the mayor has pledged that we are going to have 75 percent of all trips by walking, biking, or transit by 2032. Right now we're at about 50 percent, um, five to six percent, um, five, six, seven by biking. Walking is about 13 to 14 percent, and the rest is by transit. 38, 40 percent is a pretty big uh, uh, share. So we we still have a ways to go. We still have around 15 percent more trips uh, that we need to get people out of single occupancy vehicles. And the picture on the right, to me, I, I've commuted there many times on my bike, and, and probably some of you have too, but. Mm -hmm to look like Amsterdam when you get a protective facility that people feel comfortable and safe riding in. And that's K Street going north across, I'm sorry, that's 15th Street going across K. Uh, uh, the project um, in the Eastern downtown area was more or less identified in the move DC. It was a little bit to the, to the east, a little farther east. Um, the, the corridor of 9th Street is highlighted in, in yellow, but there was definitely a need for uh, an eastern downtown north-south connection because we have 15th Street as the prime north-south connection on the western end of downtown. Uh, Move DC, the update, uh, which is, uh, you can go take a look at that online. Uh, the the uh, bike network proposal map is showing, uh, is showing a purple line, um, Actually, showing a green line because it's uh, it's it's actually um, planned, not not just uh, one of the things that we're looking to do later on uh, as a network connection, but it's on there. And then, in particular, this project was fully developed through a very uh, exhaustive study of multiple corridors on the eastern downtown um, uh, area uh, through this eastern downtown protected bike feasibility study in 2017. I will not go into this long uh, list of 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 uh, project history items, but um, Mike and I met back in 2018 with some of the stakeholders, uh, Penn Quarter Neighborhood Association um, in the southern part, uh, and then uh, some other folks north of, of uh, Mount Vernon. Um, and uh, it was put on hold in 2018, and then it was brought back on uh, just a couple months ago. Um, just this was asked at other ANCs that I've presented at um, is, you know, why the 9th Street, you know, maybe we should look at other corridors in the eastern downtown. Well, we we did that. We did it exhaustively, we looked at everything from 4th to 9th, and there were a long uh, analytical process of elimination uh, that 9th Street um, has the fewest difficult trade-offs in order to 
install a high quality protected bike lane. Uh, that was the end result of that. And you can go and take a look at that. Just Google Eastern Downtown uh, Feasibility Study. Um, so, so you can understand what it looks like. This is north of Mass Ave. So this is not your area, but it is a two-way north of, of, of Mass Ave. And so in this situation, we are taking the northbound travel lane because traffic is significantly lighter going north than coming south. Um, and we are then moving the parking out. You can see my cursor. The bike lane goes against the curb, very much like 15th Street, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. A floating parking lane and then one travel lane going northbound. Um, that would be the proposed condition north of Mass Ave. South of Mass Ave, we actually have a little bit more room to work with because it is uh, a one-way street. Uh, existing condition is uh, three travel lanes southbound, permanent parking on the west and permanent parking on the east. What we're doing uh, in this proposed condition is putting that protected bike lane against the east curb, bumping the parking out, pulling a few spots back in order to create left turn lanes, uh, having two lanes off peak and then this west curb will have parking off peak. That would be the major change to parking um, in, in this proposed condition. Um, this is a very full slide, I apologize, uh, but this is a number of uh, areas of the project that I wanna focus on. Safety and continuity of the bike facility is the first one. Right now, it's a very high stress um, existing condition to bike in, there's no continuous north-south bike lane. Um, 11th has a bike lane, but it's just a standard bike lane and there's nothing else uh, east of that. And there are no uh, pedestrian crossing islands or other pedestrian safety enhancements. Uh, these are some things we're adding. So with this project, we get 1.6 miles of protected bike lane, which is one of the longer continuous corridors in the city. Six of six heavy turn movements will be protected. That means with like an arrow where you have a red arrow and then you have a green arrow to go. And when you get to go as a driver, the pedestrians and cyclists will be stopped. But when the driver has a red arrow, the bikes and the pedestrians can go. Or we are prohibiting a few turns in a couple places. Um, and we're adding six pedestrian crossing islands south of Mass Ave, uh, several more north of Mass Ave. Um, the other reason this worked out really well uh, in the planning uh, process, looking at comparing the different corridors in Eastern downtown is that the, ve the vehicular traffic or what we might just plainly call, you know, traffic delay or the congestion that would be caused by fitting this facility in is, is not as big an impact as it was on some of the other corridors. Um, so right now, Mass Ave, um, 9th Street at Mass, operates at a, a level of service D. And just to get uh, a lot of people who are not familiar with sort of the traffic jargon, um, level LOS stands for level of service. And it's a long time used measure of, uh, of del traffic delay for, for vehicle drivers. Um, and uh, level service D is about 30, is 35 to 55 seconds. Level service E is 55 to 80. And uh, level of service, oops, I forgot to put the F in there. Uh, F is, uh, 80 uh, is over 80 seconds of delay. So right now, the worst, uh, as you probably know from experience, some of the biggest congestion is at Mass and New York Avenue. Um, uh, Mass has a, a, a congestion level of the E, which is, is pretty bad in the PM, in the PM peak. Uh, New York Avenue is at D in the AM and the PM. H operates at, at a, with a delay of, of, of of 35 to 55 seconds. PAN also operates a level of service D, which is 35 to 55 seconds of delay in the PM. When we squeeze in the bike lane and sort of rejigger the lanes, we will have two intersections, Mass and New York will drop to level of service E, could be a D, but there, it's probably gonna be an E. Um, all the other intersections will be at least LOSD or better. A couple of them get a little bit better. Um, the interesting thing is the southbound travel times will actually decrease um, from 11 to eight minutes. They did some travel time estimates in our, in our traffic analysis. And that's a, mostly because we are cleaning up the operations of the roadway, both south of Mass and north of Mass, we're adding left turn pockets, um, which allow the turning vehicles to be out of the stream of the through vehicles. Um, and that really does help um, um, the traffic operations. Northbound, um, which you don't have to worry about, uh, north of Mass Ave, we are having to get a small increase because we are moving all the traffic into one lane. Um, 
the other re other thing that's interesting on the safety um, is that there um, these turn pockets, which we are adding, pulling a little bit of the parking back that remains in the floating parking lane to put these left turn pockets in, actually does uh, create a safer roadway, with fewer crashes, fewer uh, rear end and side side, cra side swipe crashes, which is what happens when someone's in a through lane and they want to turn left. Um, cars try to bail out, move over to the right, and sometimes they don't make it and they strike the car in front or they side swipe the car next to them that they didn't see. Uh, there are, um, we are adding again, 10 dedicated left turn lanes. Uh, total six of those are south of Mass Ave. Oops, sorry. Uh, curbside parking. This is of great importance, um, probably the most important for many stakeholders on the corridor. So right now, south of Mass Ave, there are about 89, uh, approximately 89, uh, metered spaces. There's also a, a, a hotel taxi stand at the Renaissance, and there are a couple other shuttle spots on the uh, on the corridor. Um, south of Mass Ave, in the proposed condition, there'll be 54 metered spaces, which means 20 metered, uh, sorry, so 35 metered spaces are removed from south of Mass on 9th Street. 20 um, are converted from full-time to peak hour restricted those are on the west side of the street, which becomes a travel lane so that we can gain back the space taken by the bike lane um, during the times when you really need it, which is uh, during the peak the rush hours. Uh, we are trimming the Renaissance Hotel taxi stand uh, by a couple spots. Um, and then you don't need to worry about uh, Sunday angle parking or the convention center it's not in your area, but we are dealing with those things uh, in the other uh, parts of the, of the corridor. Um, I would pause now before I go. I got three slides that show the plans. Um, does anyone have any questions about this uh, or any clarifying questions about this slide? Just want to pause for a second. I do have one question. So the parking spaces that are going to be lost um, south of Mass, um, exactly what are those cross streets? Um, you know what? I can I can show you. I can't say that off the top of my head, but when we move to the next, uh, the, the plans, you'll be able to see because I have the existing and the proposed on, on each side. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure, no, it's a good question. I, ha I have a question, if yes. uh, you, you can take one more. Uh, I, I'm thrilled to hear about this because I use that corridor all the time and uh, it's very dangerous in that uh, portion below Mass Ave to connect down to uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. So this, mm -hmm. is, this is fantastic. But uh, my question is about the FBI building. Is that not going to uh impact the the uh i, I is there a is that a tear down going on there and is that going to impact this in any way no it it's not it's um right now we're still planning to use that uh curb edge for uh full-time travel lanes because they don't allow parking next to it so it actually benefits in terms of vehicle flow okay so the construct the uh, whatever oh. The, the demolition there is not going to affect the uh, time timeline on this project. No, we, uh, I, I, I didn't, yeah, maybe you can tell me, I wasn't, I knew that this was in the works, but- I, 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 I did, I, I don't, I know nothing more than, nothing specific about it other than that, that, that that's mm -hmm. impending, but I, okay. I just was wondering what uh, the connection was. No, that's right. a, we'll have to take a look at that. Yeah, that's yeah. a, that's a great, question, Sherry, and I know that um, I don't believe that has been decided um, in this administration on what they're going to do with that. There is some um, um, construction that is happening there now that does restrict the westbound lane right. uh, along the FBI building, and that is just a um, uh, some repair that is okay. happening at the building. It's not a tear down Okay. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Sure. And yeah, I think it will be a, a, a matter of working with our permits department when, when demolition does uh, at some point happen. Um, the bike lane hopefully will be there, uh, but it's on the other side of the street. So what would be impacted would be the, the curb lane or they have a lot of setback from the curb. So maybe they can do their work without taking a travel lane. Right, right, right. That's Excellent. Always yeah. Excellent. Um, and we do have a question from uh, Reginald Black. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to get clear on 
the existing lanes versus the new lanes. And I'm like, I'm very concerned about losing 35 metered spaces. Um, and that, and that, uh, uh, LOS, you know, time there. Um, I've traveled in this corridor before and those LOS times are way longer than what you got there. Um, and I thought there was a dedicated bike, I mean, bus lane already here. So is that going to get changed or I'm just trying to understand how that's going to affect parking downtown and how, you know, how some of the more public transit ways are going to be affected um, by the addition of this lane. Because if this lane continues down past 8th Street where 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 you have on this map, now you're going to start affecting the uh, the pickup areas for like the X2 and the uh, and the and the well the 42 right there um, as you go into the FBI building. So I'm trying to figure out where now is the dedicated bus lane. How are we going to alleviate the parking pressures, losing 35 spaces and um, um, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, what's going to happen to the bus lane that's there? No, that's a very good question. Um, I will swing back down to this, uh, to the bottom here. So this is next to the FBI building and we do have the bus uh, only lane. It's a very, it's not very long. That's one of the things about it. It's only from uh, it starts just north of uh, uh, north of F Street, uh, and there's a that's when a, a, an unprotected bike lane starts about there, just past the, the library. Wait, so which, so, which yeah, so we, we'll we'll look at that, but probably I I think and maybe Mike can help me out. So we have a big enhanced transit, you know, priority transit program that is also being heavily funded by the mayor's 2022 budget. Uh, I don't believe that this is a, uh, is, is slated to continue as a, as a bus priority corridor. So the bus would be in mixed traffic in the three, same three lanes that, or in the right lane um, that, the, that the, the cars are in. That, I'm sorry, could you clarify the picture I'm looking at real quick? I'm trying to understand why do I see two nine streets? Which one is which real quick? The upper one is existing condition. Mm -hmm. One is the plans. Okay. So, so you, see, you see meter, the bright green cars, there's a little uh, key over here. Yeah. Parking is the bright green. So what we're doing is pushing out the metered parking on the east side, although taking a few away, because as I said, we're creating these turn pockets here before E and before D. Um, and then we're taking that bike lane that's up against the FBI. There is a standard bike lane against the FBI building right now. And that that will go away. That will become a, a full time uh, travel lane. Uh, and then the uh, the bright green cars existing up here become light, uh, light green, pale green. And that is means they will be uh, off peak parking. OK, so 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 are we saying now that the 79 is going to change route? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear you no talk about the 79. And just north of this F Street right here, the 42 pickup is right there. Yeah, so we're, not changing the we're not changing yeah. the bus stops. We're not changing the bus stops. The bike lane is on the other side of the street. We are taking away the parking mm -hmm. for, for rush hour, just for rush hour. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there would not, the buses would may be affected because we're going to, uh, I believe I'll check with our transit folks, but we're going to not have that short bus only lane. Uh, but we will have uh, bus stops will be against the right curb going southbound, just as okay. it is today. Yeah, right. so, so really there's not too much impact on the bus, although uh, I do uh, appreciate you bringing to attention the, the short mm -hmm. bus only then I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah and, and that, that, I'm sorry, that bus lane is not a... Not well abided? Is not abided by at all. <laughs> <laughs> down mm -hmm. that street seven, it, seventh had the same problem yeah. right it is it is a it's another lane that is utilized and the uh the 42 pickup there that you're referencing um gerald that block 
of between G and F is a no parking block that is just the bus just is able to pull to the side there um, at that area. That is not a parking lane. That is actually a, a lane of traffic. What, what I'm trying to get at, though, Mike, is that yeah. if you if the, if 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 this map is true and that far left yeah. lane is a travel lane then the bus pickup is in the middle of the lane and you're going to have a problem right here at this corridor with people getting over to the right to try to get out of the bus lane. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And get over and continue down ninth street. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. That, that happens now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That happens right. now. Even, right. Even with the parking there. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that will not be uh, much of a change then. Um, yeah. My only other inquiry would be some of these parking spaces look like they go to some of the businesses in the corridor. So like I know this church right here, first, you know, first congressional. I know sometimes in that parking when they have church uh, people park there on Ninth Street because it's close to the church. Um, so I'm trying to figure out um, from here, how do we alleviate some of the parking concerns in this area? Because like it's I mean, even even with the previous map with the double parking lanes in this area, um, people that are frequent in places like uh, like uh, C Street Department of Labor, um, the tax department and others that are in this F Street, 9th Street, and uh, 7th Street corridor, those people are parking this far back, like to go to, you know, Judiciary Square and, and, and like the government agencies there, you know, even, even some of the Superior Court stuff, some of the probate court stuff, people are parking this far. Um, I, I have experience having to park mm -hmm. this far from a government agency, you know, actually east of where, what you're showing me right now. So okay. how do you see to uh, minimize parking impacts by taking away that second, uh, those 35 metered spaces? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, we looked at a lot of different corridors and um, this corridor had probably the least parking impact uh, of all the, of the finalists, which is mainly Sixth Street was the other one that rose to the top. It had actually more parking impacts and more safety problems. So, um, you know, th there's no way to, to fit in uh, across the city. There's no way to fit in protected bike lanes or the, the bus priority lanes that the mayor is asking us to build without removing something. And what we usually have a choice of a travel lane or parking. In this case, we're taking, mostly we're taking a travel lane mm -hmm. and moving the parking out, but that does create some challenges on the opposite side of the street in this section. Um, I, I hate to, I, the only thing is that the reality is that is that um, car parking, personal car parking is relatively low on the hierarchy of needs. Um, mm -hmm. it, that's just the reality. The mayor has said that herself that something, you know, what's going to give in order to create more incentives uh, to take uh, transit, to create high, high capacity and, and priority transit and our bike facilities. Um, is parking is is often what what needs to go and we have to accept that those are some of those changes that happen with this type of a program we try to make this impact as low as possible um, as we develop the plans um, so we're, we're that's you know one of the nice things about this corridor is that the parking impact um, you know of, of essentially 35 spots on a one you know on a uh, uh, you know almost a three quarters of a mile stretch uh, compared to the about 1,800 that are in sort of the eastern downtown area, they did do a just basic parking inventory in the study. It was about 1,800 spaces. Um, and, and so it's actually a very small proportion of, of, of that total, uh, but it's not insignificant and it is an impact, but there's just, there's just no way around it, you know. Um, if, uh, we, if I we, may make we, a comment and a suggestion, um, and then we can move on, but... Um, my comment is that I think the reduction in parking 
um, is going to affect more so low income residents, especially residents east of the river who come downtown to do business um, in in 2C. So I think that um, I think we have to take that into uh, consideration. And then also the suggestion would be to take a look at uh, buildings in and around where the protected bike lane is and see if they already have dedicated garages. And could we um, try to work out some agreements where uh, parking is reduced on some of these streets that they could um, uh, sort of like do away with some of the parking fees and some of the restrictions in some of the garages? That way, people coming downtown to do business who live on, you know, further out on the east end of the city um, have a different parking option, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, we can. Uh, there are, I think, a, a number of uh, garages in the area that that have, I think, some public parking uh, capacity. Uh, but we could definitely look at that. Yeah. Um, and we have another question from Howard Marks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, George, uh, for your presentation. I'm a very avid. I live at the residence at Gallery Place at Seventh and H. I'm an avid bicyclist. I Bicycle about 70 miles a week, 70 miles a week from this hub here at 7th and H. Uh, when I go northbound, um, I use the, as you referenced earlier, the 11th Street uh, unprotected bike lane. Um, and uh, trust me, uh, it's a big problem, especially the number of delivery vehicles that block the unprotected bike lane on 11th Street going northbound. Uh, it's a very serious problem, despite the mayor's efforts to try to curb control that um, the, the blockage. I totally support and um, am very enthusiastic about this proposal um, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, I've just been listening the last several days to uh, a presentation on YouTube by Jeff Speck. You may know him. He's one of the world's leaders in terms of making cities more walkable, more bikeable. And these are, gen these are exactly the kind of recommendations that he makes. He goes all over the world uh, in order to make cities more livable. And DC is the most walkable and bicycle friendly city uh, in the United States, probably. Um, I just have a couple of uh, things I wanna point out on your map. Um, the first is what you have up here on the screen, uh, First Congregational United Church of Christ. That's actually over the MLK Library. Right. And that church is right. actually on 10th Street. It's actually on 10th. It is right. not face 9th Street. You probably know that. If yeah, you go actually, I forgot to change that. Yeah, I was that someone pointed that out uh, a few a couple of months ago. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, could you move the map further north uh, towards uh, yeah. uh, Massachusetts, uh, I, I can't do that, only you Yeah, can. yeah, here we are at Mass now. Okay, well, the Greater New Hope Baptist Church too, you know, also fronts on 8th Street, not on 9th right. Street. Okay. Okay. Um, and you know, Massachusetts Avenue, you have labeled there is not Massachusetts Avenue. You know, that's K Street. Yeah, right. it, it's, it's, every map has a little different name on it, but thank you for, uh, I'll try to standardize it. So it's, uh, so it's, um, so my concern is that next block, the short block between K and Massachusetts in mm -hmm. front of the Carnegie Library, um, oh, okay. that's a major turning. There's two left turn, two le dedicated lanes to turn left from southbound 9th onto K Street. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, then there's uh, two other, currently there's two other lanes to go straight ahead. I've noticed in the last couple of months, amazing amount of uh, illegal turns being made. We, you know, uh, the reality is we don't have traffic enforcement anymore, except automated enforcement. So I'm very concerned about the safety, safety of cyclists, yep. especially going northbound, crossing K Street, heading towards the uh, Carnegie Library mm -hmm. area and message and uh, yeah, and also Mount yeah. Vernon Place. So yes. I, I think that's something you have to address. Yeah, it is something we've uh, that has been central to, to making this uh, work uh, safely. And that is the protecting the cyclists 
um, and pedestrians for that matter, but from the turning vehicles. And so that is a location where we're gonna have to uh, uh, take uh, a long, hard look at the signal timing uh, because we're gonna, it's still the, the lane, because of some uh, wider lanes that are existing, we still have the same um, number of lanes coming through there, which is kind of remarkable, but the two lefts will, are, are held, and I agree, we have this problem on L Street at 22nd where we have uh, an arrow controlled double turn lane across the protected bike lane. And I've actually asked the police uh, who I work with in the traffic enforcement division to go out and actually try to um, patrol that and to do some enforcement there. Cause some, some drivers, they got the red arrow and they just go anyway. So right. it is something of concern, uh, but first we got to make sure that we can make all the, the, the phases of the cycle work and get heads and bikes across and hold the vehicles and, and, and divide up the time. Um, right. and, and we just, you know, it's one of those things that's very hard from our perspective as we design it. We design it in a way that it's supposed to be used safely. And if someone decides not to do that, then that's a very, that's, that's a tough thing uh, uh, to deal with. And we don't have the tools to deal with that. Um, well, you might, and, you might address that through signalization, making sure that and, the cyclists are able to see, yeah. uh, have good signals. Yeah. I would also point out H Street, the intersection of Ninth and H, there's a lot of left turn going southbound, turning left going uh, eastbound on H. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a lot of high speed turns there, another intersection to watch carefully. Well, that will be, if you can see in the left part of the screen here, there is a left turn only pocket. We pulled the parking back to allow for a left turn pocket. So that will be a, a fully signal controlled left turn. So hopefully that conflict that exists today with pedestrians where vehicles make a high speed left turn. Hopefully so I'm gonna ask that um, we we have to, to move forward. Uh, George, could you uh, show us your your I guess your your request or your what are you the, what is the next steps in the bike lane? Uh, so we're just looking for comment we're trying to reintroduce it to the community. Um, right. And, and we're going to meet with uh, the downtown bid. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to meet with them soon to really make sure that all the different uh, businesses uh, that are part of the bid are, are uh, that we get their feedback. Um, we're going to meet with um, other stakeholders like the portrait gallery. They have a fairly hazardous driveway that sticks out right here and yes. which is a problem. Uh, the Renaissance Hotel um, among others on the other, other end of the corridor. We're, we're in a we're in the outreach phase. So we're the comments that I've received uh, about the bus uh, issues, about the turns, about um, um, all the, the things that I've heard today. I know Mike has taken notes, um, and these are things we're gonna uh, we'll go take a uh, you know keep in keep in, in mind as we move the design forward. We're at a, this is roughly a thirty percent design. We will continue to take comments and and. Um, and then it will move forward by the end of the year, we'll probably have the, 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 the final design. Um, and we'll come back in the fall for, for uh, ANC consideration for a resolution in support um, after we try to incorporate all the feedback we can get over the next uh, you know, three months or so. So George, and if people have comments, where do they need to submit their comments to? Uh, well, you can submit them to uh, directly to Mike and me, and I think we have, uh, we can put- Can you put your email in the chat? Yeah, I'll put, I'll do that. Actually, Mike, um, do you mind putting them in? That would, um, sure, yeah. I'll take care of it. And that, thank, thank you. you. And then that way, if people still have more comments, they can follow Absolutely. up that way. Yeah, no, that works fine. We're just, we're, 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 we're kind of early in this process of restarting it. And, and um, you know, the mayor wants us to do it, but she also wants us to make sure we hear it here people in the community and, 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 and stakeholders. So, yeah. Absolutely. And and I so appreciate you bringing this to us and that this is such a needed, um, a needed service or a needed design um, in downtown. I, I, I recognize that parking is a premium always um, in, in this area and, um, but, we can't expect bicyclists to ride in traffic um, because 
you're, you're like the seven or 8% high stress rider. <laughs> I'm, I'm on that other end. I'm that 15th right. and 15th yep. street, um, yeah. bike lane, um, almost all the time. And, and I appreciate this, this, uh, this mapping. And I have some other suggestions that I'll, I'll email to you as well, uh, with this. So I'm very supportive. Um, and I see that uh, Mike has put your emails in the chat box, and uh, I would encourage folks to to really consider this. And uh, are you able to supply us with this um, this PowerPoint? Yes, I will put it uh, turn it into a PDF since it's a little too big, and I'll send it to you. Uh, that would be great. And right, yeah. those who are interested, I am happy to uh, distribute that. Um, out uh, to folks um, to look at if they wanted to look at it in more detail, et cetera, uh, to provide some feedback on it. But I just wanted to make one last sure, quick comment. You know, I just wanted to emphasize the importance of protected bike lanes specifically. I know you stated it at the beginning, but it's not just about increasing ridership. There are real risks to people's safety and lives when um, there aren't protected bike lanes. And that I think is something the mayor has emphasized and why this is high priority on the list of, of modes of transportation is, you know, this is really lives versus convenience in some of these circumstances. So um, thank you for the presentation. Presentation. I just wanted to make sure I emphasize that as well. Um, so thank you so much. Great. Thank you all very much for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you all so much for that. Um, I would like to uh, move forward um, with uh, Kenyette Robinson. I'm sorry, I probably... I think totally Kenyatta. Kenyatta. Yes. Robinson, um, who is president and CEO of the Mount Vernon Triangle Community Improvement District, um, who is here to talk with us about um, some activities um, related to parks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? We can. Okay, fantastic. Um, appreciate uh, ANC2C giving me just a few minutes of your time um, to talk about an area that uh, a topic that we believe uh, is very vital uh, to the livability of our downtown. Um, and I particularly want to uh, thank uh, Commissioner Miski uh, for her engagement um, on the matter, as well as I see uh, Harold Clusters on the, uh, on the Zoom as well. And he's been a longtime supporter and advocate of this effort. So I wanted to, to recognize Harold who is one of the uh, original members of ANC2C. Um, but um, this is an effort we've been working on uh, for quite a while. And while Mount Vernon Triangle is um, fully north of uh, ANC2C, we are um, adjacent um, to your area and you have a great number of constituents and stakeholders uh, who would benefit from some of the work that we're doing. And so we thought it was important um, to share uh, this update with you all. And specifically um, at the end of this presentation, I would like um, for your support and um, conveying to your ward council member, council member Pinto, um, your support of this effort, um, which we will also in parallel convey to council member Allen, who is um, very supportive of the work we're doing as well as chairman Mendelson, given we are in the budget cycle right now and there's a specific budgetary ask. And so, um, I'm getting this uh, presentation to advance. Give me one second. Everyone see my presentation? Yes. Okay, let's see if I can get it to advance here. Here we go. So I, I think um, you know it's very important um, to lay some context um, for what we're talking about today. Um, and for those of you who were here in Washington, um, 2003 and prior, the reason 2003 is so important is because uh, that was a year prior to the Mount Vernon Triangle CID uh, being established as one of the districts, um, now 11 business improvement districts. And the shapes you see here, they're in color um, within the triangle. Um, those were the large scale, um, you know, high dense buildings. Um, they were in the neighborhood. Certainly there were other smaller buildings um, in the neighborhood at the time, but um, essentially this was the density at the time. And the one thing I'll recognize is that three of these um, sites are actually faith-based institutions. And so um, not a whole lot of density. But as you progress through five-year increments, so starting in 2004 to 2009, uh, the first five years of the CID, um, you start to see um, density begin to develop. Um, 
some properties um, south of um, Mass Ave and ANC2C now, as well as the City Vista um, property, um, the public private partnership with the District of Columbia. Um, down to the bottom right corner of the triangle, you see an area called Cobb Park. Um, that's going to be um, of seminal importance um, later on in the presentation. Then you see in 2010, 2014, um, more density um, began to arrive um, in the neighborhood and then even more density. And then um, progressing into 2020 to 2024, um, where we are now, the cycle we're in now, um, this is um, you know, current and a projected future density. Um, specifically, you'll see between uh, the previous five-year period and this five-year period, areas east of the triangle and then just south of the triangle, namely Capital Crossing, um, come into existence. The one thing you don't see um, at the same time as we add all this density is um, parallel amounts of green space um, here within um, the triangle. And you'll see um, the Mount Vernon Triangle um, area highlighted um, in the center of the map. And these are the only areas um, of green space um, within this very um, large and uh, growing community. And this is an area of high importance um, to the stakeholders and residents and office users that we um, survey on an annual basis. And so this is something we made um, a very um, key part of some of the programmatic efforts that we've undertaken as an organization. And so one area of um, key importance to us is this space here, just south of um, the, the roadway that you see um, on the map here, that is an area uh, ANC2C. So that's Capitol Crossing, um, which is um, now completed with the, the two buildings along Mass Ave and then Georgetown Law. But this space here um, that's now been off is called Cobb Park. It's been a park for over 40 years and um, it's an area of opportunity that's long been identified um, as a space um, for the community to come together. Um, it's 52,000 square feet, so 1.2 acres, and um, an area that's long been planned um, to be um, a significant addition to the green space inventory within the community. So just to back up really quickly um, about this space, um, there was some money in the budget um, to support its reactivation. Once property group partners, that's the developed that's the developer that developed Capital Crossing once they left the site and um, to bring the site back to some sort of usable condition um, for the community. An RFP went out earlier this year um, to hire a design builder um, to bring the site back to productive use um, for the community. We've had some pricing pressures. Um, if anyone's followed sort of the global pricing trends on things such as concrete and timber, you'll know that prices are all up um, right now. And so we have to find the additional funds uh, through the Department of Parks and Recreation um, to help meet that budgetary obligation, but um, that those monies were identified and hopefully um, the phase one reactivation of this site will begin soon. But we have much bigger plans um, for the neighborhood. Um, we would like to see um, a parks network in and around Mount Vernon Triangle that won't only serve the Mount Vernon Triangle community, but communities around us. Um, the southern parts of Shaw, the northern parts of area, uh, ANC2C, um, the western parts of Noma. Um, all of these areas could benefit from um, additional activations of parks and open space in the neighborhood in ways that are um, um, in parallel to um, some of the needs that people have throughout the neighborhood. So, um, for example, Million Park, which is near our Fresh Farm MBT Farmers Market, mm -hmm. that's a great space to have events uh, for mm -hmm. the community. Cobb Park would be the destination, right? That would be the iconic open space that would have art and a fountain and a cafe and outdoor dining. That's the destination. Um, and then um, Regal Wald Park, which is near to Safeway, that's currently used for pet recreation. We can enhance that, um, working in partnership with our partners at the National Park Service um, for pet recreation. So in the recent um, Committee of the Whole hearing um, with Chairman Mendelson, um, the Mount Vernon Triangle CID requested $10 million uh, to support a parks network in and around Mount Vernon Triangle to help um, activate um, these parks and open spaces for our community um, over the next uh, three to five years. We requested this money be placed in the capital budget of the district. So that's the long-term um, approximately five-year capital budget as opposed to the operating budget, which is going to affect 10-1, um, the start of fiscal year 2022. Um, so we thought that that request um, you know, um, uh, was, was somewhat simpler than asking for money to be placed into the operating budget for this upcoming fiscal year. Um, the key uh, anchor for us, we believe, is um, the bold reimagination of Cobb Park. Um, that's the space that we talked about earlier. 
And we um, envision this space as being a place for the community uh, to gather. So whether you're a resident, um, whether you're a passerby, whether you're a Georgetown law student, um, or whether you're an office worker, all of these individuals can come together and convene um, um, within Cobb Park. We envision having um, um, spaces with um, food service, um, a cafe, um, so that individuals can come throughout the day um, and just linger throughout the park. And then places for um, kids, for example, to recreate, as you see the children here um, in the splash pond that we have envisioned here. This proposal, uh, we petitioned um, the community in June, um, has the overwhelming support of our local community as expressed by all of the buildings that have been highlighted. So um, whether it's a commercial property owner or a number of residents, um, hotel properties, et cetera, and then ANC commissioners as well, including Commissioner Miskey. Um, this proposal that we put forward to the council has the overwhelming support um, of our surrounding community. And this is also expressed by the signatures received um, to our petition. I will say that um, south of Mass Ave, which is an ANC 2C, uh, we've had um, probably 40 to 50 residents of 400 Mass Ave um, sign on to a petition um, asking for support of, of this petition. So that's our ask um, um, for tonight. Um, that's our presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I have two questions. Why is, um, one, I know the capital uh, crossing development, uh, when they were developing it, they used the space to park equipment, put dirt and things like that at, at the time, I believe. Um, why weren't they charged with reactivating the, the park after that happened? And why is it still fenced off? So I can't speak to um, any agreement that property group partners may have had with uh, the deputy mayor's office for planning and economic development mm -hmm. with respect to their obligations um, post leaving the park. What I do know or what I was made to understand is that um, there may have been a proffer um, in existence um, as part of um, developing uh, Capital Crossing, whereby property group partners um, may be on the hook for upwards of $50,000 um, in monies to help reactivate the park in some way, shape or form. And so, um, you know, we're actively, you know, working to secure that funding uh, to make sure that that's added to whatever funding that we have available um, for that activation. With respect to fencing, um, that was something um, to be um, perfectly um, um, I'm upfront about this. The Mount Vernon Triangle CID, our organization worked with the city to do, um, to help maintain the security of the site um, so that, um, you know, we don't have bigger issues in our hands while the site is currently um, unencumbered with uh, legitimate activity. And, um, you know, while it's still in this sort of um, um, not in service uh, status. And so uh, we wanted to make sure that the site was secured until the point that we can activate the site with legitimate activity. Got it, got it. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, commissioners, do you have questions or comments? No, thank you for um, presenting on this project and, and your work on it. Thank you, Commissioner. And we Absolutely. have- Absolutely, it sounds amazing. Thank you. And we have uh, Harold, uh, Howard Marks, I'm sorry. Uh, can you, this is a wonderful uh, proposal, has my support. I was just was wondering, uh, you had uh, children going through a splash, uh, splash pool or whatever that's called, plus splash fountain. And I saw that there, in the uh, artist rendering, there was a gentleman, I believe, with a baby carriage, something like that. Uh, but you don't have a children's playground. This is There's a great need in this area. There was a group that was formed about mm -hmm. uh, five years ago of the mothers uh, to try to get uh, the National Park Service to put in a children's playground at what today's called Chinatown Park. They were unsuccessful. Um, it's a huge issue. My grandchildren are might spend the next summer, not this summer, but the following summer with us. And we have to take them to a uh, children's playground way up in, in North Shaw. Could you please address that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I'm glad you asked that question. Um, so in the process of, um, the first thing I'll say is on our website, uh, we have, we, we our organization put um, significant amount of financial resource into doing in, uh, Mount Vernon Triangle Open Space Study. And that document uh, is available for anyone who wants to take a look at it. And we did a great deal of polling um, on the question of, we have 52,000 square feet of space. One space can't serve every use. And so, you know, what are things that the community really wants us to do in this park? And one of the things that really came out um, to the fore was that 
Uh, the community expressed just an area that they can just relax. So passive recreation as opposed to active recreation. Um, you know, um, um, so relaxation, landscaping, um, food service. Those are areas that came um, really to the top of the list. And to be perfectly honest with you, um, um, activities such as active recreation, like playing soccer or playing basketball and children's recreation, those came to the bottom of the list. I will say that I believe part of the reason for that is generally uh, the, uh, the individuals that we surveyed, right? Within Mount Vernon Triangle, you typically have um, mostly single folks or you know, younger individuals without children. And so, um, you know, um, you know, those types of uses may not be as in demand, um, but certainly we do have, we are aware, um, you know, just north of the park, um, particularly around New Jersey and Kay, um, a great number of residences that have um, children in them, uh, most of them are affordable um, residences. And so we do understand there to be a significant amount of um, children density um, in the neighborhood. And so what I would suggest to you is that um, if we're successful in securing the funding for the phase two activation, that's the real money, right? To, so we can go out and hire a really world-renowned landscape architect is that you participate in this process and you make those needs um, known as part of that um, participatory process. And then um, perhaps we could have some type of children's recreation incorporated as part of the long-term um, vision for the site. Um, this phase one reactivation is just landscape, um, of something just to make the site usable as open space. Um, our organization plans to do some programming in that space. So imagine movie nights, roller skating, um, there's an idea that we already had and downtown bit beat me to it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, ice skating. Um, I won't confirm nor deny having talk, spoken with the cats about maybe doing some winter ice skating, movie nights, um, multi-denominational events during the holidays, um, interfaith events um, with, with the various religious communities in and around the neighborhood. So we have a great number of um, activations that we plan to do. So despite not having a whole lot of money um, to do, um, you know, the, the, the real big blowout of the park we want to do, we do plan to supplement that with activation, but I would hope that you'll be involved in some of the longer term conversations about the future use of the site. Should we um, be successful in getting the council to put money in the budget over the long term for its capital planning efforts? And and this this ask that you have is for all of your 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 parks. Is that right? Not just not just the Cobb Park. That's correct, um, but I will say that the cop park effort is probably right. eighty to ninety yeah, percent of, exactly. of, of the ask. Yeah, Terrific. Million Park is about a half million dollars. Um, that's right at near the farmers market, the Mount Vernon right. Triangle Farmers Market, um, and then Regal Wald in the space along New Jersey. That's the remainder of the the ask. Got it. I think this is uh, an excellent um, suggestion, and I know that we don't have enough green space, or our green space is is growing up with concrete and, and uh, other things. So I am totally, uh, I think this is an awesome idea and I would love to see that activated. Um, and your, your ask to us would be to uh, push uh, council to approve this 10 million in the budget. That's correct. Um, I provided to you separately, commissioner, uh, yeah. my testimony. Yeah. Um, which is on the record, um, and um, any letter of support that you're willing to provide, um, I think will be greatly appreciated. We need allies. <laughs> yep, <laughs> right now. exactly. In addition to Councilmember Allen. Yes. Um, go ahead. I was going to say I can motion for a letter of support uh, for the bid that was just presented on for the Cobb Park and the other park projects. So we have a motion on the table um, to send a letter of support. I will second that. Um, all those in favor? So three of three commissioners uh, approve. And when I send that directly to Mendelssohn and, and who would I send that to? Do I send it to you? Um, I would suggest uh, Chairman Mendelssohn, yep. um, Council Member Pinto and Council Member Allen. And if you wouldn't mind a CC to me so that I can ensure that it gets into the proper hands. Got it. Awesome. Sure, Shinkle, please see, see me on it as well. Absolutely. Jennifer, we'll be happy to. Awesome. Thank you. So we'll thank get you, a letter Jennifer. of support out to you. Thank, thank you very you much. For your time. And thank, thank you. you very much. And you uh your the Mount Vernon Triangle is a, a great asset to all of our community uh to come over there and there 
one of our closest grocery stores of a, a full uh, grocery store is, is located there as well. So um, thank you for all that you do. Thank you. And I'm putting in the, to the chat the um, where you can find the open space study as well as other uh, support materials uh, related to this. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, next, um, we have um, had Thai restaurant at uh, 1100 New York Avenue Northwest for a new uh, sidewalk cafe, unenclosed. Um, and I do, let's see here. Um, there you go. Sorry, sir. Go, go for it. Okay. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Chris C. Chang uh, is unable to join us tonight. However, uh, I'm here to answer any questions or concern that you may have. Uh, my name is Charles Keir. I am the owner of Ha Thai Restaurant. Uh, and I've uh, been here since February 1995 when the old convention center was across the street from us. And uh, amid the pandemic, many customers still do not feel safe dining indoors. Therefore, uh, we would like to ask for your support for our sidewalk cafe application. Uh, the hours of operation uh, will be 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Sunday to Saturday. Uh, there will be four tables, 12 seats total, and there will be no live entertainment. Uh, also, the ABRA has already approved our request uh, pending on the sidewalk cafe permit issuance. Uh, I also like to mention that uh, the public space committee hearing will be held next month uh, on August 26. Your supporting letter to the DDOT will be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Terrific. Um, and you, you're utilizing the you're utilizing seating out there now. Is that correct? And that's just because of the pandemic response at this point. Uh, Correct. We uh, apply for the. Uh, give me just one moment, please. Sure. We apply for the temporary uh, permit back in beginning of the year. I don't exactly rem remember the date, but uh, it was. Um, it will be expired. End of July, I believe. Got it. And um, and you're you're also um, this is the space that is directly in front of your uh, of the restaurant. That is correct. Got it. Got it. Um, I think that outdoor seating is is fantastic. Uh, this is a very wide sidewalk um, in this area for the other commissioners. And um, um, there are uh, no residents is um, in this vicinity um, as well. So, um, so I, I would move that we send a letter of support um, for um, Head Thai Restaurant uh, for their D dot uh, Sidewalk Cafe. Second. All those in favor? All right, three of three commissioners uh, voting for that. So we'll send a letter of support and we'll get you a copy of that. And, uh, and uh, Ms. Chang as well. We appreciate your support and hope to see all of you at my restaurant soon. Absolutely. <laughs> hope you like Thai food. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Terrific. Well, have, Thank you so very much. You all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll move on to planning, zoning, environment, and historic preservation. Um, we have uh, Miss Stein, who is from 
E T H Terraces uh, talking about uh, the Square 487 public space review um, at 605th Street, the former Metro uh, building, if I remember correctly. Hi, Michael. Um, it's Katie Lenz. I'm actually oh. going to present on behalf Hi, Katie. of um, I think Alyssa's on as well. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? You may, please. All right, thank you. Um, can you see it okay? Yes. Great, thank you. You see just the presentation? Um, we, uh, yes, we see a little bit of your Adobe uh, yeah, yeah, reader, yeah, okay. but yeah, but yeah. That's fine. Just making sure I never know what I'm sharing, <laughs> so thank you. Um, well, good evening. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Katie Lenz. I'm with the Rockefeller Group. Also joining me this evening are um, Jane Mahaffey from Stonebridge and Manny Egoagonwa also from Rockefeller Group. Uh, we presented to the ANC back in February, mm -hmm. uh, but just by way of background for those who might not have been in attendance, we're here to present updates regarding the redevelopment of the Jackson Graham Building, which is located at 605th Street um, and occupies a full city block between 5th and 6th and F and G. Uh, the property, I, you should be seeing um, photos of the existing uh, building just for reference. Um, but the property served as the WMATA headquarters since the 1970s. Um, in a partnership between Rockefeller Group and Stonebridge, we were selected by WMATA back in 2020 to redevelop the property. Um, and as I, we explained back in February, the, we intend to preserve the existing eight story office building um, preserve the structure and then add three additional floors and a penthouse on top um, and then renovate the building into a trophy quality office building. Um, as we discussed at the last meeting, the decision to preserve the existing structure is really driven by the fact that WMATA has infrastructure that needs to remain within the building. In particular, there is a red line metro tunnel that runs uh, right through the B3 level of the parking garage. And so our goal is to minimize any risk or disruption to that, both during construction and um, thereafter. Um, our purpose for presenting this evening is twofold. First, uh, we've presented our concept plans to you back uh, in February. We wanted to provide an update to you um, just where we've where it's evolved since that meeting. And then the second reason for coming tonight is um, to let you know we recently filed with DCRA and DDOT an application for a code modification. Um, and specifically, it's related to our facade system in order to meet energy requirements, which I, I can walk you through. Um, but as part of the approvals process with DCRA, they look to the local ANC for support. Um, so first, we've made some subtle changes to the design. Um, let me flip to... Um, this was the rendering I think we showed you back in February. Um, and so... Let me just flip them to the next one. So this is the original rendering we showed. Um, and we went to CFA and received CFA approval back in May. Mm -hmm. And so this is an updated rendering. Obviously, that was night versus daytime. Um, but the main differences here are this Northeast Pavilion got smaller. And then the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, the mark, mm -hmm. what we call the marker facade actually grew. And I'll flip to the next rendering. So. This is the Northeast Pavilion on the left side of the screen that got smaller. The marker facade um, actually got larger and mirrors um, the kind of the scale of the National Building Museum, which is directly behind us in this rendering. You can see a little collection of the rendering. House, um, you can see the setbacks and as well as the addition of this brow, um, what we call the brow up on top. Um, let's see. Um, other, I think, key elements of the facade that were critical to the CFA concept approval um, included the use of limestone elements along the base of the building and also within the cornice details. And then the articulation of um, the architectural fins, both at the ground level and throughout the main building facade. So these vertical elements you see throughout, um, those are what we call the, um, the architectural fins. And in between, they actually have a shading element, um, like a perforated metal that will look like limestone and add um, shading for solar gain purposes for the building. Um, I talk about the difference. 
that's really the main differences from the last time um, you saw these renderings. Nothing major, just wanted to give you the update um, that we did receive CFA approval on that and we are advancing design. Um, and then the second piece of tonight's presentation is just um, the code modifications. I'm gonna flip to a different slide. Again, back to the original building here. Um, we filed an application for a code modification with regard to the facade system. As I mentioned, we're preserving the existing concrete structure and the perimeter of the existing concrete structure, which you can see in these images, including the beams and then the edge of the floor slabs, um, it's exposed right now as part of the existing facade. And its relationship to the property line um, is very, it's highly variable around um, three of the four sides of the, well, all four sides are variable, but with regard to the property line, um, it's both vertically and horizontally varies a lot with regard to the property line on all three sides of the building. Um, in some instances, the facade is currently within half an inch of the property line and in other areas, it actually sits three quarters of an inch over the property line. So we're already projecting into public space just with the existing structure. Um, and in order to preserve the existing structure and improve the energy efficiency of the building, um, the method in which modern curtain wall systems attach to the building require us to project into public space on the north, west, and south facades. Um, it's not required on the east facade just because we have a very, very generous setback already on that facade. Um, the maximum projection that we're seeking is up to 12 inches. Um, and just by way of context, six inches is already allowable by code, but just given the existing condition of the building where we're already at or beyond the property line, we're looking for an additional six inches of leeway in the code modification. Um, in addition to the facade, the architectural fins, which I mentioned, kind of act like a sunshade. Um, I can flip, show you a detail of this. Um, so you can see here, this is just kind of a detail of this piece of, this is our glass or windows. These would project 12, uh, 12 inches over the property line. And then you have these, what we call the fins and the perforated metal panel, which are solar shading, those would project as well 12 inches over the property line or up to 12 inches. Um, and then what else? Um, oh, I think one of the really important things to note. That makes me feel these projections into public space, they occur at locations that are well above the ground floor level um, and thus would never, it will not impact the pedestrian experience and the use of the ground plane. So you can see highlighted in here, this is looking at the Western facade of the building. You can see everywhere that the facade projection would um, be beyond the property line is well above the sidewalk. In fact, the, the minimum above the sidewalk is about 15 feet. And then the max down here where you can see the grade change, it starts 25 feet above the sidewalk. So as a pedestrian on the street, I don't think you would ever um, even realize this is happening. Um, and then the last thing- Katie, I was just gonna say to talk about the cornice at that line, which actually is allowed, but projects out. So it actually projects out farther than either of the two glass or the uh, fin. Correct, this cornice that Jane mentioned, you can see the red line here at the bottom of the yellow. That's the cornice she's referencing. And what is allowable by code is a projection of this cornice. And so that will be further out. So as you're walking on the street, if you look up, you would more likely see this cornice hanging out over than you would ever see any of the facade projections up above from the glass or the fins. Um, and the last thing um, I'm gonna flip to a different slide. The, um, the south facade of the building along F Street, uh, what we call the area way, you can see here in the bottom left image, there are steps that go down and there's a significant grade change from the southwestern portion of the site to the southeastern portion of the site. And so those steps exist to take you down, they wrap the building, and then the grade along the sidewalk, they kind of marry up here at the same elevation. And so the plan here is to abandon this areaway, which does project into public space, and bring this up to grade. So the sidewalk would extend from the face of the building and then just follow the grade all the way down. So it would improve the pedestrian experience and also um, access to retail, which this, we had planned to put retail here along the south, southern um, facade of the building. Um, with that, that's that's the summary. Um, I don't, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address them or 
I know it's getting late and I'm sure people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Katie, just, just to uh, highlight that F Street corner there, that becomes a double height space right now. If the image down on lower left, you sort of see how the, yes, that becomes a double height space as we bring the sidewalk to the building. So you really have a, a, an improved pedestrian fill down there with all those uh, columns in place. Yeah, Katie, if you go back to the, maybe the rendering, the, uh, uh, you can really see the. Yes, right there. Yeah, so this, where he's refer referencing now, um, maybe this one's even better. It's actually better, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. right now the existing building, this is one story, we're, we're now making this two stories. So you'll have a much um, grander, larger open feel here as you walk down frankly, all sides of the building, because it'll all be double height on the first floor. Awesome. Thanks. And that's intended all to be retail on that side. That is great. Um, commissioners, do you have questions? Um, could you just explain a little more, sorry, exactly what is being cut out that public space and how much is left? So say it's the sidewalk there, is it, you know, five feet now and it would become four feet? I'm just want to make sure I have a good idea of that. Um, um, I don't, nothing is getting, we're actually gaining sidewalk. So this brick area will go away completely. Can you see that bottom left image? So those stairs will go away, that brick area will go away completely. And the sidewalk you see on the right side here where there's, I think, I think that's a woman walking, um, that will actually carry all the way over to the facade of the building. So we're widening the sidewalk. Does that help? And then this, um, if you look here just at the site plan, we're maintaining this along the eastern facade, we maintain um, the setback and there will be retail down here with some outdoor dining and then you know, it'll be more of a park-like area here. And so this will all be redone, new streets, give new landscaping. Um, and we're happy to present that, we just haven't developed it yet. Right, so all three, I think you said three different sides are gonna have the um, permit to be expanded. Does that cover all three sides or is that just one side where you described there? I just wanna make sure I'm yeah. understanding it. Yeah, it's, it's on three sides. It's on the F Street, Sixth Street and G Street but it's all above the second level. So none of the, none of the uh, right of way projection, that's all in the, that's all in the office um, curtain wall and the fins. So it's how the curtain wall is attached to the structure and then okay. the fins out in front of that, that create the sunshade. So there's no changes on the ground level, the ground level. relative okay. to the sidewalk. Just wanted to check that was the case for all three. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, correct. Sorry if I didn't understand your question. This is the- No, it's fine. Yeah, this is the west facade where the area in yellow is where it projects. So again, down mm -hmm. here, there's no nothing to the pedestrian area. This would be the north facade, so similar condition. And then the uh, south. Well, I was gonna try to get, um, Mr. Mark's playground paid for in that park, but since you are giving us back great uh, sidewalk space and the uh, the double height, I think I I really uh, appreciate that. Um, and so you would you would be you're asking us um, to approve this code modification to allow for the overhang on to public, overhang onto public property, I guess. Correct, correct. In that situation, got it, got it. And I'm uh, happy to provide, within this deck there is more detail and I'm happy to provide that. I just didn't know for presentation purposes how much detail you wanted versus just an explanation. <laughs> Right, right. And, and that makes, I mean, what you're asking for makes sense. And I think that the fact that you are um, enhancing this building, making it um, much more um, energy efficient by doing this overhang, uh, this system uh, that you're putting on the building, I think makes a lot of sense uh, to me. So I, I, I appreciate that. Um, so 
I would move that we send a letter of support for Square 478's code modification uh, related to the facade system um, on the three property lines. So um, second, but I, just to be clear for the record, it's uh, square 487. Oh, 487, my gosh, thank you. I appreciate that, square 487, thank you. It, you know, it's it's late. <laughs> <laughs> Almost 847. <laughs> yes, um, there is a second. So um, all those in favor? So three of three commissioners voting in favor. Um, Katie, may I ask if you um, would uh, send me some written documentation for my letter of support to send to DDOT? Is that correct? Or that, that would go to that would go to that would go to DDOT, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, it goes to DDOT. So, yep. would you like sort of the technical summary within it? Yes. So yes. that you can insert. Yes, that I'll would be more be than happy to provide that. Absolutely. Yeah, because I think that would be probably much more articulate than me saying, yeah, the, <laughs> the facade is overhanging a little bit and da 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 <laughs> That would be really great. We'll get that to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just to added note, I believe you guys, you will get um, something routed from DDOT, the package that we submitted to them also, but we, we will also do this in addition. So you got it. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and um, we also, oops, I don't know what I did there. Let's see what happens. Okay. We also have um, tonight, um, we have uh, two uh, planning, uh, we have a, another uh, planning zoning and uh, environment historic presentation. Uh, the Chinatown Review Committee has sent us uh, two drawings for exterior signage um, on properties. Uh, one is for the Baker's Daughter at, seven, at six, 675 I Street, uh, which is um, an exterior sign uh, review. Um, is anybody from the Baker's Daughter here? I'm gonna go ahead and project um, the, the signage application. Um, this is for um, a cafe market concept um, and they're taking over a previous cafe um, that would be at, um, as I indicated, 675 I Street. Um, the exterior uh, sign includes a illuminated storefront sign as well as a double-sided blade, which are those blades that come down that kind of stick out from the sidewalk um, where they're seen on both sides. Uh, that includes uh, Chinese characters. Uh, this is in the Chinatown community. So we do require that there be uh, Chinese characters uh, for the Breaker's Daughter. Uh, and the attachment shows uh, two items. If you can see, I'm gonna zoom in here for you. Michael, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, well, that's a problem. Forgive me. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was trying so hard to show you this. It was such a good description. It was such a good description, <laughs> exactly, yay. Um, so the signage uh, would be across the top um, of the building that would say the, Barker, the, the baker's daughter. It would have the Chinese um, characters. Um, you will see over on the left of the screen, I'm gonna try to zoom in a little more. You will see they have the standout uh, blade which says the baker's daughter as well that can be seen on the, the streetscape um, as well. Um, they also have placed um, signage in their windows as well um, for this location. And the, the little pop-out sign would be the electrical sign that would be illuminated uh, for display. So that pop-out sign is perpendicular to the wall? 
That is correct. Okay. That is correct. Um, and the only requirements um, that there is, you know, related to like the placement on the building, of course, making sure that it, it follows the characteristics. It cannot be overpowering to the structure um, and it must contain the uh, Chinese lettering um, for it to be uh, required. Um, I, I don't have any challenge with this um, at all. I'm wondering if the commissioners, if you have comments or feedback or if there is uh, community members that have comments or feedback. Looks good to me. Yeah, I don't have any comments about the signage. Um, I am curious, do you know exactly what they're gonna be selling? Um, baking items. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was a given, yes. I just wondered if you could be a smidge oh, more specific. Oh, a smidge okay. more, okay, a smidge more specific. <laughs> Let me see here, hold on here. I it does look like they have another location in Northeast. Um, so you could look at their website, which oh, do they? Okay. bakersdaughterdc.com. So, so, someone put it in the chat, so thank you dangerously close to to my apartment and my <laughs> yeah um, i have no issues great um we have no uh challenges either uh the office of planning didn't have any of urban design division had no recommendations uh for for this location as well i move we send a letter of support supporting the signage for the baker's daughter second all those in favor? Okay, three of three commissioners uh, supporting that. Um, the next item we have is related to Smash Burger, uh, which requires the same um, um, the the same kind of approval process. This is uh, located at eight zero four seven Street. Um, this involves new signage for the restaurant that is currently under construction. Um, these are going to be actually acrylic cut out Chinese characters. Um, and um, and uh, they are um, 11 by 23 and one inch thick. And I'll show this to you on my other screen here, maybe, hold on. Oops, I guess I'm still showing here. Let's see, where did I do with the signage? I think I could share mine if you want. I, could, I have it. Could you share? I'm sorry, I don't see it in Don't be my... sorry, no problem. You did it all night. Is this right, what you were looking for? Yes, that's what I was looking for. Um, <clears throat> the The, this is actually 10 feet wide, um, the, the signage area. Um, and um, the, the signage you will see, they do have the blade signage that comes out from the wall as well. Um, that would include um, Smash Burger and the Chinese leathering on it. I think this shows. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. well, when I first saw this, I thought, Ugh. <laughs> but then after I actually walked by the building and I actually looked at the building, um, it actually does fit the character of that storefront. And this is the, this is part of the space that was, uh, I believe it was called Finnegan's Bar. Uh, the Irish pub, oh. it's part of it. The actual main door, I think, that was Finnegan's is to the right of this. So I have no um, objections to this. And we're just, again, that it's not, you know, intrusive to the character and that it has the lettering. Yes, and that looks it looks, as well. it's conceptually designed. It's, it's promoting the Chinese letters. Um, lettering in the Chinese community, which is a predominant feature in the uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinatown design plan. Yeah, 
no problems here. I'm gonna um, stop sharing at this point, I think. I would move that we send a letter of support for the Smashburger signage. Does, did any community members have any comments? Okay, I move that we send a letter of support uh, for the Smashburger signage. Sorry, I'll second. That. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor? Awesome. Three of three commissioners voting yes uh, for that. Um, thank you. Uh, we will now move on to um, other items, and that is the grant application process. Sure. So I don't know if Harold is on tonight, but um, we've sort of been kicking around an idea of coming up with a, a volunteer committee to help out with um, grants. So each ANC is... Um, has a pot of money that they can use towards um, different community events, if you will, or community um, associations. So um, something along the lines of perhaps, you know, dealing with crime or neighborhood beautification or um, historic preservation. So there's, 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 a, there's a wide realm of uh, possible, uh, I guess, areas that you could apply this money to. So I think what would be great if we could have is if there's anyone who's interested in, um, in being part of uh, a grant process, uh, let me know. And so the idea would be that we would need to come up with a list of ANC 2C priorities, things that are important to this neighborhood that we could um, put the money that we have in our accounts toward, um, like some of the things I just mentioned. Um, and then, of course, so we'd come up with those priorities and then the criteria of how we want to, um, you know, uh, uh, disseminate the funds, um, those sorts of things. I think from what I gathered, there's there's not uh, one specific set of rules for how ANC spend the funds. And so from what I've seen, every ANC sort of comes up with their own idea of how they want to, you know, um, process this. So that would be something that um, I'd really like to do. We have as... as as has been pointed out, we have a good chunk of money that we've been sitting on for a while. And it would be great to be able to use some of those funds for um, things that benefit this community. So if you're interested in being part of a committee that um, Harold is sort of heading up, um, get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with him. Or if you already, uh, you look, you're about to say something, Michael. <laughs> no, H Harold is on and he has oh, raised he? his hand. Yes. Oh, has he? Okay. Well, I, I Great. Um, so Harold, uh, feel free to hop in. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm glad we've finally arrived at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm certainly happy to work with, uh, with the commissioners and the members of the community to, to help try to implement and put something in place. It's, uh, uh, you're sitting on a, a fairly generous pot of money and it keeps growing. So uh, uh, let's all work together and figure out ways that that money can benefit the community. So thank you Absolutely. for getting to this point. <laughs> well, thank you for helping us get there. Um, so yeah, so like I said, we, we, we definitely need to like sort of lay a, a really good foundation and groundwork about how we're, about what we're gonna do in the process that we're gonna use to do it. But um, yeah, it's gonna be exciting. So hopefully um, a couple of you um, would be interested in doing something like that. And that's all I have, Michael. Great, and I, I think- just complete... Oh, Ben. Oh, sorry, sorry GK, that, that application is now available probably on the Office of ANC website, is it? I know it's so just- So there is, there, uh, there is an application that's available. Um, he did, Simon or Gottlieb did mail it to me. Um, yep. But from, from what I can tell, it's, it's, I don't know that it's substantially different from the one before that I had, <laughs> which, is, which is fine. But what I do not have, and I don't know that they, that they necessarily provide are actual like set guidelines so we would need to still come up with our own so there is an application mm -hmm. available and i do think we have the flexibility to actually um to modify that application if the committee wanted to do that so so there's a lot of flexibility to play around with with the application itself and also to create guidelines about how we're gonna you know dispense funds great i was just gonna suggest people might want to look at that i don't know how much of an idea maybe it gives none um i i haven't looked at it yet of what they're looking for obviously it won't tell us what type of idea but um i didn't know I'm, if that was a good honestly i'm i'm not sure when when i when gottlieb emailed me i i 
I want to say that he said that it wasn't actually on the website yet. And that's why he was yeah. emailing it to me. Okay. But well, it may be up now. That, that's, that's been a couple weeks, or that might've been a week yeah. or so ago. So it may, there may be something up there now. Um, but there are, if you're interested, um, let me know. And I can point you to some of the other ANCs that do have, um, you know, specific guidelines and rules up about how they do their grant applications. Great. Um, I believe um, we were, I believe that we as an ANC are not able to fund activities that involve the purchase of food. Um, yeah because we were, we were going to um, host a community um, day or activity, a community something, and we were poo-pooed um, on doing that because we weren't able to use the funds for, for those, those resources. Um, so there are some limitations, but, yeah. but by and large, um, this can be a variety of different um, activities. I, you've heard the art projects going on this evening. Um, we could, you know, do something like that. We could do um, a variety of different things. Just, just putting yeah. that out there. Absolutely. So, yeah, one of the what I'd like to see happen is that we can, you know, do some sort of a survey and see what people are interested in and what they feel like the priorities are in this community. Any other questions, comments? All right, that's all I have, Michael. Awesome. Um, the uh, return to in-person, we had great news this evening. <laughs> um, not, not necessarily great news because we're still in a virtual environment. Uh, great news because we were not sure where we were going to be housed at. Uh, because currently where we were at the Wilson building, which is not ideal, um, the building is still uh, mostly closed um, to folks that don't work in the building. So that prevents us from having our community meetings there. We were looking to go to the library for those activities, but the library is not uh, fully opening until um, September sometime uh, for evening kind of activities. Um, so we were kind of in this conundrum on what we, how we were going to do these meetings. Um, the commissioners uh, met um, a week or so ago and maybe two weeks ago and now, and we talked through some of this and we would like to move toward a, a hybrid model of getting in person at some point for those who can attend in person and having um, a virtual connection. Um, as well. We are, however, limited by the legislation um, and it does take a legislative act for us to change and be able to do um, some of these items uh, a little differently. So um, we're, we're still TBD um, on a lot of this, um, but it looks like um, the commissioners have also um, decided to cancel our August meeting. Um, that was, um, there's a number of conflicts that were happening uh, with the meeting. And we decided that it was, we were going to, to cancel that meeting. And our next ANC meeting would be on September 14th. This, this doesn't preclude the commission uh, from calling a special meeting, which would require us if we had some urgent act of business uh, to perform that we could call a special meeting and give proper notice and, and hold that meeting sometime in August. But at this point, we are canceling our August uh, meeting in lieu of the September 14th uh, date. Uh, commissioners, do you have any comments? Do, do folks in communities have any comments about any of that? All right, I think that we might all be ready to take a sleep. <laughs> um, so with that being said, um, I, uh, there's no other items of business on the agenda. Anybody else have any items? Then um, I would like to move, we adjourn our meeting for this evening.
Seconded. And all those in favor? Awesome. Thank you all so much. And thanks everyone for attending our meeting tonight. We really appreciate you hanging in here and being diehards with us. And thank you commissioners for all you Bye. do too. Take care. Thanks, good night. Good night.